Welcome to episode 107 of Cowboy Shit with Ted and Wacy. I'm Ted. He is Wacy. Make sure to uh, follow us on the social medias. I'm at Ted Stoven, wherever you can find me. He's at Wacy Anderson, wherever you can find him. Most and, places. Uh, yeah, check out uh, check us out on our, our on the social medias. Check check Wacy out on TikTok too. It's quite entertaining. The Cowboy Shit official shit. man. We got re- even on our, our regular Instagram, Cowboy Shit official, and TikTok is our uh, Instagram, and then our Twitter is. At cowboy shit, you can find just find us by searching our username. Yeah, you'll um, find us. Yeah, we're everywhere. You'll find we're us. Not on, Look us up. The social media, it. we're on it. Check it out. The only thing we don't do is Snapchat because fuck that. We already have yeah. enough of them. We're adults, so yeah. Ah, uh, here we are, man. End of the year. We're into uh, this is season uh, five now of the show, but uh, yeah. we kind of we start in December, so it kind of follows the company year and it's kind of funny so it's it follows like, like a more of an accounting schedule. more of an accounting schedule yeah you know it's not really it's just it's different okay it's different so end of season five though again amber marshall uh jeremy bueller so this is already the third show of season number five mm-hmm. with how about it jb mooney we've been talking to him for a long time trying to get him uh, on the show and it just hadn't happened uh I wish we would have done a long time ago, but it just didn't happen but uh, i i, I think t- timing wise it worked out man it's just one of those things you know a, yeah. lot of the, a lot of the people that we've interviewed, it just sometimes doesn't work when we initially want to have it. But when it comes to fruition, it works out and ends up being a good time and ends up being a good show. So when are you, uh, when are you going to do a show about your fire alarm? <sighs> Man, I've been having a day. We're gonna having a couple of days here. So oh, I fuck. don't know. So what, so what happened was, here's what happened to me. With, yeah, some shit the went fu- down. With, with well, here starting with the bit. fire alarm. So while we were away in Texas, Mm-hmm. I got a text saying that they're doing their fire alarm check. And then, so I, I was like, okay, well I'm in America and my mom and dad took my extra set of keys. So I wasn't able to leave them with anybody while I was away. Like I have some friends who live in the same building as me. So that kind of, I was like, okay, well I have not have to handle this. I get back. And I still haven't heard back from my building managers on that regard. So fire alarms beeping at me. I thought it was a low battery, but it looks like it's probably not a low battery because it's connected to the electrical system. So I I don't know, man. I'm just a guy. I'm not an electrician or a fireman. <laughs> is it? Do you got carbon monoxide in there? That is that what it is? No, no fires. No, it shouldn't be carbon monoxide. I think it'd be a bit more aggressive if it was carbon monoxide. But but why else would it be making noise? Uh, maybe this is a test that needs to be done or it needs to be reset, and I don't know how to do that. Damn. So I'm gonna talk to my concierge once we're wrapped up here. If I if someone's around, or else handle it tomorrow. Um, or maybe that'll even be, ask my brother or something. I don't know. That'll be fun to listen to all night when you're trying to sleep. Honestly, man, I don't know what to do. So I'm. Yeah. I you just have to. Call to I just guy. walked. I just walked in the door, and it was. Got to call the guy. And I was trying to get set up for this, and it's just I'm a little flustered. And your car wouldn't least. start because it sat for three my days. Car wouldn't start. Wasn't plugged in. Car wouldn't. No, it was not plugged in at all, dude. Yeah. Um. Cool. Well, there's between my parents' vehicles, my brother's vehicle, all of the electric outlets were taken up. So oh, the old RAV yeah. got the short end of the stick there. Um, well, yeah. The golden boy comes first, man. Everybody knows that. Man, yeah, nothing happens around the Anderson household without the golden boy's approval first. So yeah, that's just the way we roll, but that's fine. Um, and yeah, so then yesterday, upgraded my phone, which is cool. But I le- apparently, I didn't make, didn't. I thought that my phone automatically backed up my information to the cloud as it should. It's 2021, but I assumed when I shouldn't have assumed. And when I got, by the time I got home with my new phone to get it all ready to roll, I had lost probably 40% of my contacts I've accumulated over the past few years. So that's really been a shit show. Um, So if anybody's listening and you have my number, it's still the same. So just text me and tell me who you are. So I know who it is. I'm going to get a lot of texts probably over the next few months from people that I'm not going to have any. And I don't mean to be rude. Um, when I ask when I say, I don't have your number saved. So 
Um, it's the yeah. same. It's the same n- new number that you got last. Yeah. So for people who have so, my number, it's it's the same. Like people like. People although, can, but it changed too. So a lot of folks didn't know the change. Yeah, but like, the people who I wanted to know it changed. No, so that's one of those <laughs> things where if you don't have my new number, sorry, sorry, not sorry. Oh, um, and then I lost a lot of my app information. So I got signed out of my Google. So I haven't had access to my Gmail. Otherwise, my oh, just my work computer I have access, I guess. But I've not had access to my Gmail for a couple of days. Got a new computer, which is cool. But I, yeah, I've just been like basically starting from scratch, like getting everything put in. I'm trying to get Microsoft Office download on my computer, and I can't get signed into my UFC account, and it's just all I just all a bunch of shit show stuff, which is fine. It's fine, man. I did it to myself, so I can't. This complain. is I'll this is uh, 2021 first world problems of uh... that. It's honestly is the most first, the, the biggest first world problem I think I've ever had in my life. Like I feel so like it's I like there's people out there who have way bigger problems than I do, but I am just frustrated and upset, and it's literally <laughs> is the definition of a first world problem. <laughs> so, yeah. anyways. Poor me, someone break out the tiny violin and wine and cheese for me. So there's I'll a be, tiny I'll microphone okay. here. You could have that. Yeah, I'm going to need it soon. Eh? But anyways, we're back. We're, we're so, somewhat back up and running. I got a new system to head into the new year with, and I'm going to do some cool shit with it. So I'm looking forward to it. Right on, man. Yeah, man. Right on. What kind of well, cool shit are you going to do? Uh, well, you, you know, know, I think we should get that to the second half of the show talking Don't about the new year and kind of, um, but I would like, yeah, we should probably write say thanks stories. to our, we should say thanks to some of our friends. Here, hey, are you gonna make get... some nice spreadsheets? What well, once to? I get off fucking office downloaded, yeah. <laughs> make some yeah. fucking PowerPoints like a boss. Like a boss. You know what? I actually don't use PowerPoint to make PowerPoints. Oh, yeah. I what use do you can- do? I use can Canva. Oh, fancy. Canva is basically it's basically graphic design for dummies. Like for me, like I Damn. I have a very limited understanding of like Photoshop, Illustrator, like kind of the Adobe suite. But Canva kind of just takes it to the next level. So if you're not really a graphic designer, you can make some pretty cool shit on there, and you can like brand it up to what aligns with your brand stuff. So it's a uh, it's kind of a cheat code for graphic design if you're Neat. if you're uh, so I made some, I've made some pretty nice presentations for it actually uh, using. But anyways, congrats. So I mostly use. Happy for uh, you. Thanks, man. It's all <laughs> part of the it's one of those layers of marketing stuff. You know, layers. people people Onions. expect you people expect you to be a graphic designer uh video editor all these kind of things under one job title so you kind of gotta get creative and figure out ways to do as as you know ted so mm-hmm. um yeah anyways we should say thanks to some of our sponsors <laughs> and, by we, and by we i mean you i mean me so hey fellas this episode of cowboy shit is brought to you by our favorite producers of ball trimmer manscaped they're the global leaders in below the waist grooming and leaving 2021 with a new product Clean yourself into the new year with their ultra premium body wash. And also we have a special offer with that. So I, I, I can't forget about the hell shop shampoo. They sent us the shampoo and the body wash and it is Try awesome, it. man. I use it. All, I use it quite often. Actually. It's great. Oh, it it's comes in those like those like big bottles with a little They're metal on it. It's crazy. Yeah, it's metal. Dude, I dropped one in the shower and it sounded like a gun went off in my shower. You probably chipped the paint. Probably. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was rowdy. I think um, that, but, uh, I think I might re-gift mine. Just really? Case. Have I you used it? Have you tried it? One. Yeah, I tried it. I might put it in the downstairs bathroom. We'll see. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, anyways, man. <laughs> I, honestly, that's probably a good spot for it, though. If you have guests over, then you have something right, like, in there. Hey, that's one of the biggest. This as, shower I, is sponsored by Manscaped. <laughs> as I'm something, something that you, something that you probably know too, is I'm, as much as we we have traveled in our lives, like going to somebody's house and using their guest oh. bathroom and there's no shampoo or anything. Oh, it's, it's like dodgy. I guess I'm just gonna rinse myself off. I guess there's it's not even nice. a, this last week. There wasn't even a bar of soap in the fucking bathroom. How do you, there you go? How so, do you do that? So even if you don't nice want to bathroom. use it for yourself, you can Renovated. use your Manscaped uh, body wash and shampoo. A shampoo and conditioner is two in one, deadly. Yeah, um, one. you can. And it's uh, not. It's not a hockey. It's not a hockey bag set of stuff. Like I could almost put no. a hockey bag, but it's. it's oh, but you, if that, if it freezes and explodes in your bag, that's not. Oh, a good that'd deal. be a that'd be a bad time. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> you can get get it for a gift. Get it for your spare bedroom. Get it for yourself. Whatever you think we got, they got. A bunch of cool stuff there at Manscaped. So you can use our ball special trimmers, code, ball nose trimmers. trimmers. They got no shimmers. They got if anything you need for your men, I even like kind of real like women, you want to use this stuff too. It's it's kind of unisex in a sense, even though it's called Manscaped. Um, they have everything you need for your grooming needs. You can check them out at manscaped.com and you can use our special offer code huge bush to save 20% and free shipping worldwide as a little treat from us to you. So check them out, manscaped.com, promo code HugeBush. They're deadly. We've been using their product. It's almost been like six months now, hey? Yeah, I think that was the, I remember looking back at emails the other day, it was like July. 
Yeah. So, so I mean, we've used them for, stuff. we've been, been working with them for a while now and they got some cool stuff. So be sure to check them out. Check um, them out. Also, we can't forget our friends at the circle four beverage company, man. They are awesome. They've been with us too for, uh, for a long time now. So um, check them out at ranchwater.ca. They got their ranch water. They got their sweet water, which is a vodka based product and they're they're awesome, man. It's summer may be over, but it is never a bad time for a ranch water. Um, never. Yeah. 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 So let's check them out. They're kind of, they're, they've kind of taken over, over Western Canada, the seltzer scene. Um, you can pretty much find them at any liquor store across Western Canada these days. If not, if it's not in the store and you want to give them a try, ask your liquor store, just find the SKU number. Most places can look it up pretty easy. It's not hard to find. Again, check them out at ranch for circle or at, sorry, at ranchwater.ca. You can find them there. Okay. Good work, Wacy. We got Good through work. it. We survived. Good work. We survived. Um, we've got a big interview coming up here, so we'll just get right to it, and we'll be we'll catch up with you after the interview a little bit. But uh, again, this is Cowboy Shit. Ted and Wacy, thanks for listening. Uh, Happy New Year, folks. Merry Christmas. All Merry that Chrysler. business. Happy crisis. <laughs> All right, well, this is episode 107 of Cowboy Shit with Ted and Wacy. I'm Ted. He's Wacy. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. But we'll we're, we're gonna get right to it. Our uh, our guest this week, the uh, the last time guest this week. Yeah, la- last guest of uh, 2021. He's a two time PBR World Champion. Made his first appearance at the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo this past December, and he's uh, he's the the highest paid athlete ever in Western sports history. Over seven million dollars in earnings. JB Mooney, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. I know it's close to Christmas, but if you want to find a get a cowboy at home, it's probably during Christmas or on a Sunday evening. It's probably good timing. Yes, sir. It's real good timing. <laughs> well, thanks for making it work. Uh, I guess getting right into it, where uh, where are you at this week? What's happening? How's Christmas? Uh, how's things going? Oh man, watching that little boy drive his flatbed pickup and half top trailer around about all I've been doing. <laughs> Finally got to go tip some bulls and work some bulls. I needed to to work, you know, been needing to work them, but Christmas kind of failed, so I had to postpone it. Our buddy uh, Luke Kaufman, he was on, I think it was 80, episode 83 of the show. He's back. He's the, I don't even know how to introduce you, Luke. You're kind of a man He's of many boss talents. In Texas. Yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did a bunch of stuff. So Luke, uh, he just sent me a picture of him and JB circa 1989. And neither of them are about two feet, two and a half feet tall. So you guys, you guys go way back. So this, uh, this should be a good set of a uh, good, good setup for the show here. I'm thinking a good setup or a good way for us to get each other in trouble. <laughs> it's going to go off the rails real fast. Well, uh, okay. So we were talking, Luke, and you, you mentioned that you guys go back far enough that you, you went to school together till the third grade. Well, and if that was in, uh, was that Mooresville or was that where was that exactly? That was uh, East Mount Moore, North Carolina, USA. Okay. Where they, yeah. where they raised taters, maters, and hell. And the only hell that our mom has ever raised was me and JB. <laughs> <laughs> we went to, uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we were like, it's probably six, seven miles apart where we grew up. And his mom and dad, my mom and dad, they rodeoed together. So it kind of made sense, you know, once we started going getting a little older going to school stuff like that so we went to the same elementary school we were in kindergarten together and it's probably about six weeks into kindergarten they realized it would be a good idea for us never to be in the same fucking class again so so they never put us in the same class after that but well, yeah we we spent quite a lot of time together from from then on <laughs> and then then they realized it was it was a uh, quite a good idea to move us apart mm-hmm. yeah yeah Once looked- we- so- once we took my father's lawnmower apart after school one day because he said it was wasn't running the only thing wrong with it was the the battery was dead but me and luke took it completely apart yeah so his dad worked his dad worked late late night shift so he'd get home you know he'd sleep mostly during the day and he'd get up and he'd go work in the evening he'd get home in the morning so he by the time he woke up to go to work before he left he just happened to come out to the barn and we have his 
it's a nice lawnmower. It's like a ride lawnmower. So like 92, 93 is pretty nice lawnmower. And we had this son of a bitch tore apart from the fucking seat all the way to the damn engine. Like, I mean, just obliterated. And yeah, come to find out the only thing that was wrong with it, it was a dead battery. <laughs> we thought we were helping. <laughs> Well, what happened when your, when your dad found it? Uh, he was not very happy. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have near as much luck putting it back together as we had taking it apart. We oh, had a shit. lot of for parts. Oh shit! Wow. Uh, well, and Luke, you were you were saying you guys got in a bit of a in a bit of trouble when you were about like eight years old. There's some some shit go down, and it wasn't even like that far from home. Yeah, the lawnmower. I don't even remember how old we were for that, but. I remember the first time I rode the bus, it wasn't because I lived like right across the street from the school. Like I could almost walk back home. That's how close I was. But the first time his mom and dad and my mom and dad decided to let us ride the bus together, we thought it'd be a good idea to take a detour through the woods. So what's usually is like a half, I don't know, his driveway is half a mile or something like that. Just walk down straight back to the house, straight shot. We get off the bus, go through the woods, go find the neighbor's cows, go whatever, eight-year-old kids do play around goofing off we pop back out through the woods like two hours later and there's cops all over the house like looking for us they thought we'd been abducted like yeah we got our asses whipped that day well and then you guys are poor parents <laughs> well and then so then what happened after uh after like the third grade did you guys end up getting you end up being in different classes but still same school or kind of kind of thing or what happens in there no, Lucas moved to the mountains to be a mountain man. Yeah. Yeah, my parents, they moved when I was in third grade. So then we only then we only got to see each other on the weekends at junior rodeos and wherever, you know, where we had very little to zero supervision. At least when we were in school, we were in the confines of, a, of four walls. But then they just let us go to junior rodeos and shit together. And then, then it really went south. What about the bus story? Do you know this one, JB? When you guys are real little? And skipped out of school what about that one? Oh, hit on the school buses <laughs> <laughs> we weren't gonna miss our ride home we just didn't learn anything in school that day <laughs> luke was telling me this story though you guys were going like skip out of class in the middle of school and go and get on the buses and pretend you're going to rodeos and and go uh play rodeo on the buses in the in the during, during class oh yeah how did they never find us? How did they know? How did they not know that two kids are missing out of school? Like that, like we would be gone for half an hour. Does they're probably to have you guys out of the classroom? I don't know. Racing hell on it, <laughs> So, so then you guys uh, end up getting split up that way, but you see each other on the weekends. So, so who who started? Like, when did you guys first start riding? Like, when was the first? the first calf or steer or like, or the, at the junior rodeos, like what were you guys doing at these things? Where, and, and where were they? I guess I don't need, I don't know the whole story here where it all began. Well, North Carolina is where they mostly were, but, uh, Lucas there, he rode and, and his parents didn't want him riding. So mine went ahead and let me continue to ride. And now that's why Luke says, behind the microphone and I'm still riding bulls and almost 35. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, it was, it started with sheep and calves. And I mean, even, even at an early age, like I was fucking terrible. Like I'd get hung up, I'd get run over. I was accident prone, whatever you want to call it. I wasn't good at any of it. <laughs> Rope and steer us on any of it, you know, but JB was like, even at junior high, like, you know, before high school rodeo, he did everything. He would goat tie, like when the, you know, the kids goat tie, uh, barrel race and pole bend and like every event that you could enter, JB was entered in every one of them and he would win at every one of them. So it was, uh, it was always fun to watch. Like, I mean, I, you know, I go in there just to have fun get to hang out with my friends and all that stuff, but he would always go and he'd always, he always excelled, you know, even, even at an early age. So it was pretty cool to get to see it. I learned from the, and at that point, like through your lens, did you know that JD was going to kind of take the world by storm like he did when he burst onto the scene bull riding wise? So funny story. There was a, there was a bull riding game that came out on the computer. 
it was like the first PBR. Bull Donnie Gay was playing that. You know, Donnie yeah, Donnie Gay. Yeah. And, and, a, and, even, and an even funnier story, like there was a game right after that, and that was actually the game for Sierra Sports that I think Sean Gleason worked on before he, before he even got a job with the PBR. And me and JB, we played this thing religiously. Like we played it and we, we made up our own guys. I mean, we would play it. We'd go outside, he'd ride the drop barrel or he'd ride the bucking barrel every day. And then we'd go inside and then we'd play, we'd play the bull ride game. And I remember like clear as day, he was, we probably had been 11, 12 years old probably. And said so, something was said, or he said, I want to be a PBR world champ. Like said it just like, like I said, yeah, I'm going to go to school tomorrow. And like, I never, like, I will never forget that as long as I live right there in his den. And I, and I believed him. I was like, well, yeah, shit, yeah, you are like no big deal. You know? So like, it's so funny. Like the first year he won it, I was like, I wasn't there. I wasn't in Vegas that year. I just texted him. I was like, yeah, that's pretty, pretty easy to do, but it only took you, it only took you 10 years to do it, but good job. <laughs> Yeah. yeah that's just that's kind of always been his mentality what's your what was your earliest recollection of of uh of rodeo or riding or being around at jb oh riding sheep i don't i don't remember riding sheep and calves uh don't let luke fool you i got hung up a lot too and i still do now if you watch the nfr uh <laughs> you know it's just I remember riding calves somewhat. Been hitting my head a lot of times since then. But uh, I remember the first big bull I got on was at a place, Luke can tell you about it. It's called Love Valley, North Carolina. And first time I was, I think I was barely 13, might be 13. Got on a big bull, got whooped down, hit in the head, hung up, got the shit stomped out of me. And I was kind of thinking to myself, do I really want to do this? Next day I was back at it again. Dang. And that was, and that would have been your first big bull would have been 12, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. When did that, when did that start? I I was 13 when I started getting on big bulls. Okay. So 13. And then was this, uh, I'm curious if this was like, well, was it at a, was that a rodeo or was that like a zebra bull riding? Cause I kind of want to go back to the zebra stuff. Like that would have been, you guys were getting on every day and that would have been at those, at those deals in the beginning, wouldn't it have been? Uh, Yeah. The, the first big bull was at a junior rodeo, and uh, the saber bull riding's boy. Me and Kenner wore those things out, little Brian Kenner. Uh, first year I made the saber finals, I won rookie of the year, made the saber finals. I think I was, might have been 16, maybe. I think you're 16. I think so. And I, ne- I never went to a, a saber bull riding. Really? They they had a couple weekly deals by my house that were co-sanctioned. And so I was going to those and I went to the finals at that weekly deal. And I can't remember how much was added, but I was only got to stay on at the finals. Long round, short round. I was only got to ride a bull that night. And Ended up winning it, and they handed me forty eight hundred cash. I thought I'd never see another broke day. <laughs> and you're sixteen. That's wild. Yeah. And that so that's how I made the Saber Finals. The first first time I made it was by winning those finals. So it got me into, and that's why like I knew Jerome and Tiffany, but hadn't really been around them a whole lot. And I kind of run around when I was about sixteen, seventeen. I run around with a pretty rough crew, and they always told Brian and. Faircloth not to hang out with me. I was a bad influence. And then once Tiffany got to got to know me, she realized it wasn't me. It's was just some guys I was going with. And and so this is your 16. Luke, would you have been like announcing these things, these, these bull ridings too? Like you you guys were running in the same circles at this point still too. Because you guys are you guys the same age or within a year or two? Like you would have had to been yeah, we're within about, a year, right? We're about three months apart. Yeah. Yeah. We were we were about the same age. That was about the time. That was when I got started getting interested in music and I actually started kind of pursuing that. And by my senior year, I mean, I was going to college basically to pay for my way to go and play music. And, uh, and he was talking about Jerome. Jerome was Jerome's everything in North Carolina. I mean, he, he started it, you know, and he did for 
guys like JB and Brian, Josh Faircloth, anybody that had any type of a notable name in bull riding, he helped them, you know, and then furthermore, he's putting on events. So obviously I wasn't, I wasn't riding bulls at that time, but I wanted to be a part of it. So that's when I got into the production side of it. So I would go to, I would go to drums, bull rides, and I would load bulls back there for 150 bucks a weekend. And I'm like, shit, I'm making a living. I'm making money, man. This is, this is awesome. And, you know, I still get to go to bull rides. And then I would, and then I'd start playing guitar and playing after parties and making money doing that. So I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. I don't even have to get dick slammed by bulls. This is great. <laughs> What? So, what, what, so yeah. What, what was your recollection of Luke Luke Kaufman as a as a bull rider, JB? It was interesting. I made him get on some stairs. Yeah, he could ride decent. The last bull that I got on, I got on in his stuff on the Fourth of July, and I I can confirm I can't confirm or deny that we were at Hooters for the previous eight hours. <laughs> so that was yeah. Any stupid thing that I've done in the last 15, 20, well, 30 years is probably because of this guy, mostly. It may or may not have had this something to do with three, four, five, six pitchers of beer, uh, all the Jaeger they had. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, and, and like, I don't know, when I was 16, 17, those were some of, some of the most fun times because you were underage and you could try and go get into bars and stuff when you're – when you're not old enough and shit and you're traveling with some of the older guys and they're likely a bad influence on a guy, but like that was, that was some of the most fun. So being able to make some money while you're in high school and going to those bull ridings and then like, so you go to the, you go to the Zebra finals and how, how did it go? Like, did you go win a bunch there too? I did pretty good. Uh, I think I rode two out of three bulls and in the short round, the third bull, a short round bull. I hung upside down, hung for like 45 seconds, got the shit stomped out of me. Just pretty much the way I do things. <laughs> <laughs> then you then you go next year, though. You're, I guess you're like, a, uh, what would you be? It goes uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in high school. So you're a junior in high school kind of thing. And then go to the, you end up going to these, going to those boy rides again because you're still only 17. So is, was there any high school radios at the time still? Or like, like what was the path before getting into the PBR stuff? Is, PBR started as soon as you as soon as you could go essentially too, right? Yeah. Um high school rodeo and I, I went to the nationals my freshman and uh sophomore year. First two years I went. Uh my freshman year I went uh the team roping the bulldog and the bull riding. And then my sophomore year I made it in the bareback riding, the calf roping, the team roping the bulldog and hand bull riding, but I told them I, I wasn't going to nationals. Went to state finals and told them I was not going to nationals and I was done high school rodeoing. And they kind of asked why, and I, I said, well, it doesn't make too much sense to me. I can ride the same bull at open bull riding, you know, and win $800,000. And I come to the high school rodeo and ride the same bull and get 10 points to go to the national. So a coach can look at uh, He wants me to go to his college. I said, I'm probably not going to college, so. I'm just going to skip out on that. I'm going to make some money. And we started going to rodeos, you know, like IPRA. They had a lot of co-sanctioned IPRA, SRA rodeos, Sabre bull ridings, things like that. And back then, shoot, there was dang near a bull riding, open bull riding, you know, every night of the week. And I'd have to go maybe no further than three hours from my house. And we could get on bulls every day of the week. How much of that plans your development then too? Like you, you must have getting on that many bulls every day and like a bit of big higher quality than high school level bulls. Like you probably developed a lot in a short amount of time. Oh yeah. You know, my parents were real big when I was younger. They didn't want me getting on practice bulls, things like that, because they said that's you get hurt in a practice pen. And that's what they kept saying. Well, once I, you know, got my license and got a little older, I kind of was, you know, I I went. I got on practice bulls every day and once I got in the PBR and stuff like that, then I had bucking shoots. I set me a, a pen up, and I always kept, you know, 10 to 12 bulls standing around there, and there was nothing for me. If I felt like I didn't ride the way I should have that weekend, I'd come home, and I'd get on 10 bulls a day, every day. Like, I'd just load them and get on and get on. And it cracks me up now. Young guys, they're like, oh, well, we were, we've we been working at it. We got on two bulls last week. I said, y'all don't have a clue what working at it <laughs> 
Well, how, how many practice bulls were you going through then? If you're getting on 10 a day, you probably had to cycle through a lot of them because them bulls would get tired of you probably whooping on them every day. Yeah, they would. Uh, but then I'd stay gone so much. You know, I'd leave and I'd stay gone for a while. And you could tell when I'd get home, they had, my dad and them, they would haul them bulls for me, some open bull and things. And he'd tell me when I'd get home, them bulls were getting lazy. So we'd You're run them. <laughs> yeah. they, they'd get lazy and – and I'd go, I'd whoop on them a little bit, and then they'd start firing again. <laughs> it could be like 2000, I don't know, it'd be 2009, 2010. I'd be at home, or I'd go, I'd go do a Super Bowl ride, and I'd go announce somewhere or whatever. I'd watch the short round on Sunday. If, if JB fell off a bull that he either rode before or he probably thought he should have rode, I'd say, all right, watch. My phone's going to ring about Monday. Monday morning, he'd text me about 1130. What are you doing today? Uh, nothing what are you doing we're bucking bulls that stands at three be, be there and he I mean, he'd run every every i mean he'd load a trailer full of them and he and it wasn't oh i'll pick this one this one this one no just run them in there we're gonna get on all of them and jb even i mean he started buying you started probably buying bulls when you when we were 21 22 years old just stuff to get on and jb didn't buy practice bulls like not most people's practice bulls. JB bought shit that bugged. You know what I mean? And that's what he wanted to practice on. Because I mean, the stuff he's getting on on the weekends, you're not doing yourself any favors by riding a 19 pointer in the practice pen. So he'd get on. It'd be me, him, Shane Proctor. Sometimes, sometimes his dad. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of times, heck, even it, when when I had my arena set up at the house, I you know, I'd call my uh, cousin. He didn't have a clue about bulls, bucking bulls, anything. And if I didn't have anybody help me, I'd call him. I'd say, hey, come to the house. He'd come up there. What do you want me to do? I said, well, I'm going to flank him. You pull my rope. And I'd have the gate rope run through the latch. And I'm like, when I nod, you open it, your main job. What's that? Do not let that gate swing back and hit me. Well, what if you get in a bind? Keep your ass out of the way. I'll get myself out of it. <laughs> he told me. Oh, he told me that the first time I'm like, what did you tell him to do? Like his cousin, he's like, he's like, I told him if I get knocked out or something, wait till bull leaves the arena and then call, and then call the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. So what was the worst wreck you got into pulling those kind of stunts? There had to be something oh, like, to go fucking haywire there. Well, my 21st birthday, I got in a pretty good one. Uh, Bart Miller was living with me. And so we, <laughs> You know, imagine my 21st birthday. I was drinking quite a bit, and uh, we're headed back to the house. He was my driver, and he said, what do you want to do now? I said, let's buck some bulls. And so I run two just good bulls. I had a black bull turn back right in the gate. He was good, and then I had a brown bull turn back in the gate to the left. And I rode those two, and I was getting on in, like, tennis shoes, no vest, no nothing, just glove and a bull rope. And uh, then I had a kind of a paint brown was swoop back horns and it wasn't too long before this i'd hauled him somewhere and he hit a kid in the face and broke his jaw pretty bad and then hooked him hooked the bullfighter out of his cleats like he was pretty mean and i guess because of what i'd been doing that morning is the only reason i loaded him uh i don't know really why i did <laughs> art was a horrible bullfighter and so i nod and he was around the end of the gate to the right and he slipped and fell in his back in what well, dropped me off in there so i'm trying to reach out i'm hollering at bart to pick him up because all this son is trying to do is sling his head and hook me and hit me bart he's 15 feet away hollering at him and he finally takes off i thought after bart well he, he just took one jump but when he took that jump i bailed when i hit i hit on my hands and knees and all he did was took one jump he swapped ends and i mean hooked the piss out of me ripped my shirt. I was bleeding all over the place. And I got up. And my dad had woke up. I guess he worked third shift. He had woke up and come outside and that arena sat right there by the house. And he said, boy, you all right. I said, yeah, hand me one of them beers. I'm fine. <laughs> the fun 21st birthday. Oh yeah. How much longer did you keep that bull around for? Oh, I ended up, I sold him to somebody. He was, I'm always trading bulls. That's what I buy, flip them, trade them, sell them all the time. Still to this day. Well, and now What's now this? you're uh, now you've got some bulls going. Uh, 
you got a, a few have been to some of the PBR events in the last little bit as well and whatnot with uh, with Dale too, right? So you've got a few going, and you've got you've got a set of fighting bulls as well, right? Well, those bulls that the fighting bulls they're actually my wife's uncles, Quattro Light Lights Out Fighting Bulls. Okay. It's just when I had shoulder surgery and couldn't really do anything. What do I decide to do? Well, let's just haul these fighting bulls for him. <laughs> so uh, I decided when I had shoulder surgery and couldn't use my arm, my right arm very good, I should haul fighting bulls and feed and sort and load those. That's insane. After after spending that week in Fort Worth with Luke at the UBF finals, whose who's bulls were that mean one the Thursday night, the, the last weekend? Whose bulls were those, Luke? Uh, those would have been uh, Those would have been Chad's. Either Chad's oh. or Crumbs's. Man, those uh, those are three of the meanest bulls I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I don't I don't know why anybody would want to have those fucking things around. Like, they are nasty. They are terrible, scary motherfuckers. And then yeah. with, with this bum shoulder, no less. Nonetheless. Yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the North Carolina water or what, but there's just something about mean bulls. It's just JB's always like mean bulls. He's he bought a fighting bull one time. He bought him at some bull sale. He was half fighting bull, half bucking bull. Remember the painted bull with the fudge brand? And like, yeah. And JB bucked him a couple times at some of those deals he'd take bulls to, and them guys didn't like getting on him. And and that was when we had started up the UBF. So this would have been 2008. It's been 13 years ago. And me and Cody, the, the other guy in the UBF, <clears throat> we called him because I, I knew we had a fighting bull. And JB's like, yeah, nobody wants to get on that motherfucker. Like, here, you, you take him to some bullfights. See if he's any good. <laughs> we took him and – He'd run some guys over and he liked bucking as much as he liked hooking people. So, but yeah, it's always been, it's fun. I mean, those JB will tell you, I mean, it, them bulls with the attitude, it's, it's kind of like a challenge, you know, being able to work around those bulls with their, with the way that they work. Cause they're, they're different than bucking bulls. They're different. They're different from commercial cattle. They're just, you have to work them a different way, you know, uh, it's fun. I mean, I, I you ought to, to see the two gates. I almost demolished a little while ago sorting them out to pin them back Lots and these these are bucking bulls they're not even fighting bulls oh shit but you got into the fighting bulls side of things when you uh like after you wrecked your shoulder in calgary that that last time wasn't it like that was the one you're healing up from yep yep and, and that, well since since calgary uh i've had to have two shoulder surgeries but that was that was on a like a big red uh, muley from the northwest. Something from I'm forgetting uh, who the heck it was. was uh, Mike Corey's. Yeah, that's bunk. right. I got on a I got on a calf out of him this year. Somewhere in the northwest over there, I can't remember exactly where we were. Mike after it, and I could tell like when I saw the boy, he said he's a three year old. He's gonna be bad in the shoot, but he bucks, and he bucked identical. Of that cow bonga. he ended up getting me bucked off and i asked mike afterwards i said what's that bull go back to he said i didn't want to tell you before he got on him, but he's goes he's at a he's, he's by cow bonga. i said i figured he looks just like him built just like him bucks just like him that uh that wreck in calgary though was kind of a a pretty major setback for you though probably one of the times you sat out more than than really ever before in your whole career yeah. wasn't it yeah, it should have probably ended my career. Uh, as far as like I blow up, my knees are blown out, both knees. There's not really much holding those together, things like that. I, my hips, my right hips, real bad. I have to go in about every six months and they have to inject it. And but as far as like injuries, I could get by with all those breaking stuff, things like that. I could keep going, but that shoulder, I couldn't do anything. I, you know, Tandy, I flew. After the short round on Sunday, I flew that Monday to Dallas. He looked at the MRIs and he told me, he said, JB, he said, I've been doing shoulder surgeries for 20 some years. And he said, I've never seen one fucked up this bad. He said, this skin's the only thing holding your arm on. And he told Samantha that next morning he was doing surgery. He said, oh, it'll probably be three to four hour surgery. And six and a half hours later, I come out like it was mangled. He said it was a lot worse once he opened me up than what he is it expecting i broke the humerus and he said they weren't just fractured they had to take three pieces of the bone completely out and screw screwed my bicep tendon back to where it was supposed to be and 
I think there's 13 anchors in it holding everything where it's supposed to go. Holy shit. And so that was, that was shoulder blade, like ripped your shoulder all the hell too. Like that was the whole shittery, right? Cause that did that, was it the front, the front feet of that bull that really got you that bad that day? Like you flattened you right out. I remember you being under him for a while, but like, it didn't, it didn't seem as bad as it was when I, when I saw, it. I remember being on the back of the shoots and like you were, it, he fucking mashed you up pretty bad, but it didn't seem like it was, I didn't realize it was, it was that bad till, till afterwards. Like I, and that's what I, old Ralph, the doctor up there, me and him were arguing there. Uh, Cause I mean, it knocked me out for a little, and I mean, just a split little bit. And I remembered everything right up until I hit the ground. And what happened was I, my rope when that, I kind of got behind when the whistle blew and I knew I was getting ready to hang to him. I thought I was going to hang up. Cause I remember being behind, he was going to whip me out over that shoulder. And so I thought, well, I'm about to hang to him. Well, when they whipped me out over there, my rope slipped across his back and it kind of just put me right beside him. Well, I guess I put my right arm down to catch myself where well, he cow kicked at me with his back foot and kicked me in the left armpit. Well, all my weight was on my right arm on the ground when he stepped on me. And that's what they told me. They said, most shoulders don't come out. You know, they'll come out the top or the front, things like that. But the way I guess position I was in when he stepped on me, my shoulder popped out the bottom. It went down through my armpit. And so they said, that's why it tore everything is the way it come out. And I guess when he stepped on me, it just kind of knocked me out for a second and he ran over the top of me. Well, I can remember it plain as day. I was trying to get up and my hat was smashed into my face and I couldn't figure out. I, I thought at first my arm was broke because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't put it in front of me. And they got to me and they said, you got to quit moving. I said, take my damn hat off. And they pulled it off. And that's when I tried to move it. And I looked and my shoulder was down in my armpit. I said, all right, I'll quit moving. <laughs> when they rolled me over, they <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. They was all worried about my neck and all this crap. And I told them I was fine. <clears throat> well, I didn't know they rolled me right over onto that backboard deal. And when they strapped me to it, I about lost my shit. I told him, I said, I've been riding bulls my entire life. And you know how many times they've ever carried me out of the arena? He said, no, uh, I said, never. I've got up and walked on my two feet every single time. Any wreck I've ever been in. I said, the last time I checked my shoulders out, there's not a damn thing wrong with my legs. They wouldn't let me off of it. I chewed his ass all the way to that little room over there. I was in matter in hell. We got in that back room, and he said, we're going to have to pop your shoulder in. I said, you're not touching me until you unstrap this, take this damn neck brace off. We can't. I said, well, you're not touching me. He said, how are you going to stop us? I said, I got one good arm. I was going to go <laughs> swing. And they finally checked some things. He said, all right, unstrap him. I unstrapped me. I said, do what you got to do. Yeah. I wasn't too happy about it out on that stretcher though that kind of pissed me off holy it was uh you, sorry go ahead waste I, I was gonna say you mentioned that like that someone you said that it actually should have ended your career like what at that point like what kept you motivated to come back and, and keep competing at a high level well like the reason it almost it should have probably ended my career it took my arm away from my free arm and i've how i've learned how to ride bulls how i've rode bulls my entire career was by making big moves with my free arm. I'd kind of get a little behind those bulls, and then I'd make a big move to catch up. Well, when I tore the shoulder up, that took it away from me. And the fact I didn't really sit out the full amount of time for it to heal. Tandy told me six to eight months, and I went to the finals four months later. <laughs> it was in the riding bulls, but I'd made I don't know how many finals in a row, and I told them I wasn't missing the next one, so. They had that thing strapped every direction you could think of. I couldn't even pick my own nose if I wanted to. And so you go to that finals and, well, I think we got to mention first that you were 90 and a half on Cowabunga. That was the last day of That was a pool. rank bull ride. I remember watching it. Yeah, this was pool. Uh, must have been, I don't know which pool it was, but you, it was but pool making the, yeah, making the short round, you would have would have made it right back to the finals, but don't get on another one until the world finals and then stay on and, and ride that bull. You're 86 and three quarters on polar vortex it says here pro bull stat so so you stay on there but then the rest of the week probably doesn't go how you want it to yeah i was i was kind of you know i was needing bulls to go right you know into that arm and so i wouldn't have to use it as much and the only one that went right was the first one i got on and everything <laughs> else. 
how did you feel going into the next year? Like going into this, into this uh, winter of 18, going to New York, how did it feel there? I mean, it, it was getting better. It was getting stronger. I mean, I was still, I was, I was having to work out quite a bit with it, you know, to try to build those muscles back. And I mean, it's still, from the way it was before that wreck in Calgary, I'd say it's 75% now. Like, it's still weak. I can do certain things, and I can tell it's not, you know, near as strong as I used to be. Like, I can pick things up and try to hand it to somebody, and it stops at a certain point. But, you know, scar tissue, things like that set in, and that's just how it's going to be. And uh, I didn't feel bad in 18. And then at 19, I think it was about middle of the summer, I told Tandy, I said, man, I said, shoulder don't really hurt, but something don't feel right. And he messed with it for a little bit. And he said, man, I don't think you tore your rotator cuff again. I said, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> and I, I, I thought you put enough damn anchors in that somebody to hold it. And he, uh, I got home from that bull riding or whatever. And I, I went and got an MRI. And damn sure enough, I tore the rotator cuff back loose again. And he said, well, I think you can make it, you know, through the year. And then we'll do surgery right after finals. Well, comes down to the time of finals they called me and gave me the invite to the velocity finals and man i was right i felt like i was riding as good as i ever have i said hell yeah i'll go more bullshit yeah get there ride two short round i get wadded up first thing to hit the ground top of my right shoulder oh, and no. it swells up gets kind of bad but they were working on it uh first round i go they worked on it that morning uh, Tandy injected it, and then I may or may not have drank two cc's of Banamine also, and because it was <laughs> like it. And so I'm getting on my bull, and he's supposed to. It's classic round, supposed to be kind of bad in the box. They had it strapped down, and so I'm in the shoot. Well, I heat my rope up and everything. They're getting ready to. They're pulling my rope, and this song on fires off in there. Well, when he does, I out of reaction, I reach over and grab the shoot gate with my free arm when he kicks my shoulder comes out and i look up and i told him i said pick me up and they said why i said my shoulder's out so they helped me out of the chute and i walked by tandy and he says it out i said oh yeah so we go back there had to cut all that shit off get it off two of them sports medicine guys are holding me down tandy's cranking on it trying to get it popped back in it won't go back in he finally looks at me he said yeah, i might send you to the hospital he said it won't go back in well, when he quit messing with me, I guess I relaxed. But when I set up, hell, it popped back in. I felt it. I said, oh, we're good now. He looked at it. So the next morning, I let him work on it again. Was Had all intentions of riding that night. And I was in the room. Was getting, I was getting ready to get dressed. I just got out of the shower. And I bent over to pick up a pair of socks to put on. The damn thing fell out. And I got it to go back in, but. I called Tandy. I said, take me out. I said, I'm going to be one-armed and I can't use it. I'm going to hit the ground. I won't be able to, you know, get up. Won't. I said, that's going to put more people in danger than it's going to do me good. So then, then we found out we were supposed to do the surgery right after the finals. That ended up being after the first of the year. After the finals, he wanted to send me for MRIs again. They x-rayed it. MRIs, I broke my damn shoulder blade. Oh, and shit. So he wouldn't do the surgery till the shoulder blade healed. So I had to wait like it was like eight months. I set out because, you know, from the finals, you know, all the way. And then he did the surgery. Hell, he did the surgery the day before my birthday in January. I woke up in the hospital on my birthday. And then it was six more months, you know, healing time. Cause I was like, well, this is the second time I've done it. Evidently, I come back, you know, too early didn't heal all correctly and tore it up again so that time i kind of kind of took the advice and said i've this whole six months to let it heal so that and that gets you back in august of 2020 and then you kind of finish off that year and go into next the next spring is 21 already and and then head to the you know head on the rodeo trail essentially kind of like mid-spring i guess really right kind of march well i guess you went to odessa in january denton here you went to a few and then go, you know, kind of hit it hard from March till the end of the year to Vegas, I guess. Right. That's kind of, yeah, uh, kind of, you know, I would like, and if I like, 
Luke told you, I rodeoed. I worked multiple events, and I'd go to bull ridings, but I like going to rodeos because there's multiple events. You know, I like watching everything and shit like that. But, you know, once we got 18, hell, I asked Jerome, I said, where we go? And he said, you want to make a living riding bulls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go to the PBR. So that's why we went there. But <clears throat> I was getting to the point in my career I needed to change, you know, 15 years of doing the same thing every weekend, you get kind of burnt out. And I was – my original plans, because I had 10 world champion exemptions, my original plans uh, this earlier this year was to go rodeo during the summer, try to make the NFR, and then use my exemptions the second half and try to make the PBR finals too. Well, we got to rodeo on and going, and I, was, I had the RV wife and little boy Jaggers with me, and – I was having so much damn fun that I said, I don't know if I'll go back or not. And then right towards the end of the summer, Bulls stepped on me at Fort Madison, Iowa, and ended up at last rate of my kidney. So there wasn't no way I could use those exemptions anyway. So I just went on to the NFR. And then uh, and then get there and go uh, go uh, win the first round. What a way to show up and, and kick some ass there. Yeah, that was a uh, first round went real good. Second round, what the shit after that? Well, and, and let's talk about that a little bit. You've, uh, you've, you've rode with, uh, you've rode, you've rode, you've tri- switched hands and still rode uh, gunpowder and lead for, was it, I don't know if it was a 90 or not still. It was like 92 you, and a quarter, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Dang. I don't, I can't remember. But I know the, I rode that bull right handed. Like I come back right handed. I broke my left hand. They put plates and screws in it. And I'd mentioned to somebody, Hell, I'll just ride them right-handed. And word got back through the grapevine, and they said on the telecast, the one weekend I missed, they said, uh, yeah, he's, he might plan on coming back with his opposite hand. And I can't remember who it was. I'm pretty sure it was Ty. He said, there's no way he can come back and be competitive at this level with his off hand. That's like swapping, you know, pitching arms right in the middle of a game or the World Series. And I heard it. I was watching it on TV. and. That Monday, JB calls I, I, me the next morning. He says, "What are you doing?" Nothing. We're we're bucking bulls at three. I said, <laughs> Who is? He said, "I am." I said, "Your fucking arms broke." He said, "I got a right one." <laughs> <laughs> I was, and I was there, and I was, i so I'm thinking the same thing. I'm like, man, like this is stupid. Like, what am I even doing here? I'm gonna get run over because this dumb. I said, "What are you gonna do if you hang up?" He said, "You're gonna get me out." <laughs> I, that first cast I had on, holy shit! You cut it, you cut it off, didn't you? Huh? You cut it off, didn't you? Yeah, I made Tandy cut it off and recast it with a smaller cast. Yeah. That first one I had on, it was like a cinder block tied to my arm. It went all the way from my elbow, all the way down to my hand, and covered all of my fingers. They were worried about my, you know, me hitting the ground with my fingers sticking out. And so I could, I literally could not use my left hand whatsoever. All four fingers were in a cast. The only thing sticking out was my thumb. So it's like I was in a calf riding again. I'd get in the chute. They had pull my rope. They'd have to take my wrap for it. <laughs> the first oh, one, he slammed me into the out gate, wadded me up. I was thinking, hey, maybe this wasn't a good idea. And then I rode a couple and I was like, oh, shit, I can do it. And then show up that weekend and, and, and do all right. Yeah, that, well, the first weekend I went, they bucked me off all three, but I started all three of them. I was just getting a little behind, and then we went to Billings right after that. And hell, first round, I lost my rope, so I swapped ropes, and I rode, I think I rode two that weekend, gunpowder and lead in the 15-15, and another bull, and then I can't remember where we went after that, and I rode a big red bull called Bad Blake, and I rode him right-handed, and the last one I got on was the last event for the summer break and spotted bull of HD and M's and he looked left, went right. And this son walked me down on his head, hit me in the face, knocked my helmet off. That's back when I wore a helmet, knocked my helmet off, flung me around on his head. And they said, what about that right-handed riding? You going to go this summer? I said, no, right-handed rat- ridings went into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, uh, but you've ridden like with every kind of, uh, injury imaginable and then, and then go and get 
you know, knocked out at the NFR and, and then like, was your head clear after that for the, for the last, uh, like eight rounds or was it still fucked up or like, what, what did it feel like? Well, like my head was fine. The problem was a lot of people don't know is I didn't tear it that round, but I'm pretty sure I stretched her out pretty good. My right groin was in it, ended up being tore. Oh. Cause right. Like, I, he started it started on that bull when he stepped on me and jerked me loose he stepped on the inside of my right leg where it just stretched me out and like my head was swelled up they they put stitches in my forehead stitches on the right side of my eye and then i had four or five staples above my left ear on this side of my head and you know I, the head deal didn't bother me you know i've been hitting the head sewed up that shit didn't bother me and i told him i said man my growing's kind of sore but the third round, I think I'm pretty sure I tore it on in the fourth round. Cause when I hit the ground, like I, I felt something pop. And from then on, we were black from the nuts to the knee. And it uh, was on us. Like I took more baths in those last six rounds than I have in the past three years of my life. Like every night, Smith's like, what do you want to do? Go to the room. I'd walk in, I'd be stripping clothes, going to that tub, grab the bag of Epsom salt, dump it in there and get the tub. Like it took me when I come back, it took me about two days before I could really get up and do anything. Like it was swelled up pretty bad. Now I'm, I'm not sure if I tore it completely in two or if I partially tore it, I probably need to go let Tandy look at it and see if it's completely tore. I'll be okay. Because once it's tore completely, you can't tear it twice. <laughs> But he might have to fix it though, I guess, if if it is tore right off, I guess. Eh? Well, if it's if it's tore completely in two, then I'll just leave it, but and just build everything up around it. And but the thing, like if it's partially tore, then it's it's going to end up tearing completely apart. It's just it's better if you go ahead and tear it completely, as to partially tearing it, because then you got you know you got to ride with a hurting like hell until it does tear all the way. So, so now that you've had some time to reflect and, and you've competed 10 days in NFR and all that kind of stuff, how would you compare the experience of riding Vegas for the NFR versus the PBR World Finals? Is it kind of a similar deal? It's it's kind of like one after another with the NFR 10 in a row. Well, I mean, you know, 10 in a row doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, I drew really good bulls. I wish I'd have waited till a later round to get wrecked out, I guess. Uh, I'm not blaming my riding on that growing i should have rode way better and but man i it vegas is vegas to me but that that was pretty cool like i always wanted to go to the nfr even when i was little i watched the nfr way before i ever started watching pbr and i always wanted to make the nfr that was a goal and i kind of set that goal to the side and went on with the pbr and when i finally got to the i guess point in my career and the age that I said, you know, if I'm going to do it, I better do it now. You know, there's, there's not too many tomorrows in bull riding world. And it was fun. I had a blast. Like I like watching other events and, you know, it, it was, it was cool. It was real fun. So what, what was your feeling riding in for the grand entry on the first night or even the step behind the shoots behind your bull on the first night? Were you a little bit nervous or pumped up or? Oh yeah. I was nervous. That's what I told him in the interview. I said, you know, I said, it's been about 15, 16 years since I've been nervous and I'm nervous, you know, it's just, and I've been on a shit ton of bulls in Thomas and Mac, just a dip, different atmosphere, you know, and those yellow bucking shoots. And cause I was sitting there thinking, man, I've watched this since I can remember watching TV. VHS tapes, man. Oh record, yeah. Record the shit out of them. Do you, uh, did, did you see Wade's wreck? In the grand entry, were you were you there like near him for that shit? I did, but fortunately, getting wrecked out early, you know, in your second round, you get out of grand entry. <laughs> I guess. Did, yeah. Did you get Did you get fined over that, or were you were you opted out? <laughs> no, they let me get out of grand entry because, like, if you'd seen if you had seen me walking down the hallway, like by the ninth and tenth round, like I would wear jeans in, like I had boots on the first four rounds or so. You know, I was cowboyed out by the fifth round i had my hey dudes on 
I'm rolling up in there. I'd go in the locker room. I'd put my damn shorts on to go to the sports medicine because they'd work on it for like an hour. Like I got to the arena every day at like 3.30 just so they could work on this growing, try to keep it loose. And like I'd be walking down the hall in my damn shorts and slip on shoes. <laughs> like I was <laughs> – I, I did see Wade Rack, though. That sucked. That's such a, such a shitty deal to like, especially after winning the round the night before and then just to get mucked out in the grand entry and that's it for you. Like, oh man, that's so shitty. Yeah, I kind of like a couple of people we were talking about, like, why don't they just do away with, away with it? You know, doesn't really matter to me. I don't, I don't care either way, but you know, it's tradition, things like that. But, you know, they said they started that and that was the intro, but now, you got pyro, you got all that. And they said, you really don't need that. And I kind of said, well, it, it kind of sucks for people, one, who don't ride horses really bad, mm-hmm. two, <laughs> for people who don't have a horse out there, which I lucked up. Like Chase Servey, he was picking up, so he would let me ride a pickup horse. But, you know, you get random horses they bring for people to ride, and, hell, you don't know what the summer gun is going to do, you know. Mm-hmm. And – it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> Are you waiting for a world class salad market getting get mucked out in the Grand Tree? Like, no. You don't know what the hell they're bringing for you. No. You uh, you mentioned at one point changing from a uh, helmet to a hat. Um, I don't think that a uh, helmet really, well, I, I know it doesn't prevent a concussion because the concussion is your head going in back, like your brain going back and forth in your skull, right? So the, the helmets is mostly for a face or, uh, you know, or a skull laceration. I, I think a guy's keep taking better care of your head without a helmet. Sometimes I, I think, right. Uh, how much to prevent scars like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Is, is that a, is that a recent one? Is that the Vegas one? Yeah. Oh, it's, shit. They sewed it up damn near right between my eyes right there. Oh, fuck. But, 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 but tell me that though, is that, is that partially why you, you ditched the helmet? Like what's the, what's the story there? Like I, my, my point is that I don't think a helmet saves a concussion. A helmet is for face lacerations. And I think without the helmet, like I know when I went, it was, I felt like I was invincible with the helmet and it probably created more, more concussions or hitting my head. But like, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, like when I when I wore one, I just I always my parents made me wear one when I was younger before I was 18. And I always told them I was going to throw it away the day I turned 18. Well, I was kind of used to wearing it and things like that. So I continued to wear it. And in 2011, it was one of the worst years I had. Like I was riding like shit. And one day I decided I was going to get on. I was getting on practice bulls and I just I didn't take it out of my bag. And. I got on those bulls and I I felt like I never lost sight of them. Like I kept my chin tucked better and I never lost sight of them. Like I, I felt like they couldn't get away from me and I never put it back on. I took something out of my bag and never wore it again. And, you know, I agree with you though. When I had one on, you're invincible. You know, if they're getting ready to hit you in the face, you're just going to take it. And when you don't have one on, you start doing shit a little <laughs> try to do it more correct so you don't get hit in the face. I mean, it still happens, but, what, what you know, was the first, what was the first event you took the helmet off? Was that Bismarck or uh, maybe? I, took off, I took it off Bismarck before I quit wearing it, but, <laughs> yeah. but that was, but that was an eye opener. You, you saw the difference though. Mm-hmm. I, I remember that you took it off that one event. Yeah. And then I think the, the, first actual event that i went to and didn't wear it i can't remember where it was at but made the short round bull weld me in the short round i bounced around on top of his head and he hit me in the face and ended up it broke my damn eye socket my cheek it looked like i had a golf ball stuck under the skin right under my eye and somebody said oh, i bet you put that damn helmet back on don't you i said hell no my head's hard enough <laughs> but but i mean other than that, I guess like the, as far as the head injuries go, it's, it's face lacerations and like a few, like, I guess you might save that way, but, but, but I guess the helmets kind of started though with, uh, with Brent Thurman though, too, didn't they? Because it, like, it, yeah. it essentially cr- crushed him that way. Right. Like that, 
Well, I guess that could be one benefit. I mean, but I'm just trying to well, think that, of like the concussion side of it a little bit. Well, when I was younger, you know, I was still getting wrecks. You're still going to get wrecks riding bulls. Don't matter how long you've been doing it or how good you are, you're going to get wrecks. And, but I, I explained it to people, you know, when I was younger, it was good. I wore it because I'd wind up underneath them all the time, bulls stepping on my head, things like that. And like I crushed, I don't know how many of them helmets. And if I wouldn't have one on, it would probably kill me, you know, three or four times. But I got to the point in my career, like I had to, I was, I needed to change something. It probably wasn't strictly the helmet, but I, you know, when I took it off, I felt a hundred times better. I never lost sight of them. So I went with what made me feel like I rode better and I felt better on bulls without it. And so I never put it back on, but you, it seemed like, you know, I, I was, when I took it off, I was at the point then that I kind of, halfway knew how to get my ass out of jams when you get hung up, things like that. When I was younger, I didn't like, I, you can ask Lou. He, he had announced an open bull riding on Sunday nights and God almighty. There was more pictures from when I was 15, 16 years old at that bull riding. It didn't matter whether I won the son of a bitch or got bucked off, but there was more pictures of me dragging hung up, getting stomped, shaps ripped off and all kinds of shit. Uh, JV, you've, uh, You've rode some of the rankest bulls like in the past fifteen years, uh, like basically the whole the, your whole career. Has there ever been a bull? Like, we know you have the killer instinct and get it done. Has there been one of those bulls we've got on them and you've rode them? You're like, holy shit! Like I didn't think I was gonna get that one done. There've been quite a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just I don't know. It it has to do with pride more than it does anything. You know, everybody said, well, if you go businessman approach that you'd probably won eight nine million dollars riding bulls and i said hey you're probably right i said but i went about it the way i wanted to do things and as long as i do it the way i want to i don't have to hang my head to anybody you know it, it's and pride had a lot to do with it if there was a bull they said that i oh, nobody can ride him then man, a little chip on my shoulder i was like all right let's show them how to do this and bushwhacker is the main one hell i got on that son of a bitch 13 times <laughs> once it cost me a shit ton of money well then so after riding like the like the bushwhackers and asteroids and pearl harbors do you feel that you were ever like cheated a little bit on the score like not getting close to that record or like you know like you see jose breaking the record or like those guys riding the promised lands and all that back in the day oh well you know it could have went either way i I always told them it really doesn't bother me. I don't give a shit if I got the high score or not, as long as my, they got my name right on the check. <laughs> what uh, going into some of those rides? What what were uh, what are the most memorable on on your side? I was listening to Flint's uh, show you did with him back in the spring, and it was uh, it was Pearl Harbor and Sioux Falls was a big one. Uh, the Bushwhacker ride has to be a big one. I want to say. Uh, uh, whiteout in 2013 on the last round of the world finals. Remember SmackDown that year at the finals, uh, when you won it, the, then you go back, go to 2015 against, uh, I think it was, was it bruiser or what was it at the end of that, that year that, that ended up breaking your collarbone or shoulder that year too. I don't yeah. forget what it was now, but Bro, uh, uh, bruiser, I got on bruiser three times, rode him all three times. Uh, the first time was at Vegas in 2014 whistle blew. He woke me down, hit me in the, face broke my jaw uh 2015 the whistle blew he woke me down hit me in the chest and broke my collarbone and the third time was in billings and i finally got away from him he didn't hit me that time <laughs> but go, like going into these big rides or what like what are, what was the most memorable or are there a couple like i just want to talk through those rides and, and your recollection of them and kind of what went down well you know anytime something come around they thought was a superstar that's the one i wanted you know well bushwhacker was the longest one uh i picked him a lot of times but there was a few places you know there's like a challenger in louisiana somewhere uh they had it it was a long round short round each night high man each night got to get on bushwhacker for a five thousand dollar bounty well guess who was a high man each night <laughs> <laughs> i had it I, so the first night, I barely got to the bottom of my nod, and he jerked me down and hit me in the face. And the next night, the last guy out could have bumped me down. He got bucked off, and they said, JB, I said, I know, load the son of a bitch. And I put, I, I rode him like 
seven, seven and a half seconds that night, I was a mad son of a bitch. I had him road dead easy. And he bucked me off right at the whistle. I was pissed. But, you know, and then, hell, the best one when I got on him is at uh, Decatur. Ben Jones went around. I was second. He got hurt. So I was first pick. And it wasn't like the draft. Like, they had all the bulls in a hat. You had to walk up on stage, pick pick your number out of a hat. Well, I pull it out, and I said, you got to be shitting me. Fifteen bulls in there, and I picked Bushwhacker. And I said, here, I, I walk off. Well, I'm the last guy out that night. They're jamming this place out. I nod, jump up there, gate swings open, breaker trips. The whole place goes dark. No way. Oh, no. <laughs> And somebody, somebody asked me, they said, well, what'd you think when the lights went out? I said, I about shit my pants. Cause I thought I told myself, I can't ride him in a lit up ass arena. And now I'm tied to him in the dark. And oh, wow. I didn't, he thumped me pretty hard on my head. And somebody said, why don't you say you rode him? If the lights were out, I said, cause the lights came back on. I was laid in the middle of the arena by half knocked out. And then the whistle blew. <laughs> <laughs> so, so going into like, uh, like the bushwhacker ride in Tulsa or, you know, the Sioux Falls ride. Like what is your recollection of, of those? What do you remember? What, what stands out? Uh, it's same as every time I get in a buck and shoot, you know, I, I tell myself the same thing every single time, no matter what, when you crawl off in there, I, right before I crawl off in the buck and shoot, I tell myself in my head, like if you're going to be a bear. You might as well be a grizzly. And you know, I, this career doesn't last forever. It's lasted longer for me than it has most people, but you know, it's going to come to an end one day and that's all you're going to have is the memories. And so I want to make the best memories I could. And that was riding rank bulls for me. What, uh, what about the, well, I guess I got a couple other questions. So there's, we got to that. We, uh, um, what are you most proud of in your, in, a, in your bull riding career? What, what sticks out that way? Uh, for me, I, that's, I always told them one thing, whether I won world titles or not, it wasn't the money, it wasn't anything. I wanted everybody to know that I never had any back down. There was no backup in me. I went at them every single time. One well, and, and uh, so going into going into going into listen to that thing with Flint the other day. And I remember, remember, I think I saw saw you do this one time, but uh, he mentioned that you uh, you're a big picture guy. So what's your favorite picture that you've uh, you've ever gifted or one that you have around? What 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 does that go back to? Oh, that's uh probably my favorite picture that I, I bought from Andy is uh one of them on one of them on Bruiser. I can't remember which one it is, but it's on Bruiser. He's leap way up in the air. It's a badass picture, but you know, when I when I first started going to PBRs, we traveled like during the summer run. And we always took my truck and camper wool. Pee Wee, Brian Herman, and Tater Porter, they traveled with us. You know, they were on there like last year or two of riding. So they traveled with us. And, you know, Tater, he told me, he said, boy, you better buy those pictures because we was looking at some of those pictures Andy had took on the computer. And I was like, nah. And he said, you better buy them if they're good. I said, why? He said, this shit don't last forever. And he said, you'll want them. He said, when you're done, you're going to think, man, I should have bought those pictures. So I kind of took that to heart. So I've made quite a few house payments at the Watson Ranch, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> There's about three books. I mean, stacked as thick as you can get them, just full of pictures. Dang. That I all, you know, and – if people like I, I get my autograph sheets and stuff out, but like, you know, if people that's, you know, built me things and shit and say, Hey, you know, if you got a picture you can send, I don't say I'll get one of them good ones and sign it and send it to them instead of giving them the plain old autograph pad. Where's your, where's yours, Luke? What's that? Your picture on, on his fucking forehead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got I got one picture of him. I don't I actually don't know where it's at, but I got him uh uh the year you rode crosswire. Where you're like 93 and a half, 93 yep. and a quarter. Is that the first time you rode him? Is it the finals? Yep. And it was like that bull never bucked like that up to that point. And I don't know if he ever bucked that like that after, but they I mean they leaped all the way out to the damn near the sharp cage and he and that bull, I mean, he stretched out sideways at JV's 
I mean, it's it's cool as shit. That's that's probably my favorite picture of him. That's, that's the best thing. I got I got a full brother to him on all my cows here. That's good. You rode that bull several times, and you're I think you're always nine more than ninety on him. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he was a good bull. I liked him. Yeah. That was early on with uh, when you were still like repping the Copenhagen stuff, like oh eight nine, right? Yep, yep. That was Copenhagen days. That was that was back in the good days. Well, I want to I wanted to get to sponsors before we wrap this up. I got a couple things here, but but um, what was the throughout your career? I guess two. This is kind of two different pieces, but kind of I'm curious who the best sponsors were throughout the years, or if you can say that. Like, I don't want to pick favorites too much, but I mean. Like there's, I was reading uh, like Forbes magazine the other day and Conor McGregor made 40 million uh, fighting, but he made another 80 million between his, his uh, whiskey brand and between, you know, endorsements, all these major athletes have, have it that way. But that breakdown's much different in, in rodeo and bull riding at this point. Like it's not, uh, yeah. it's not, uh, <laughs> unfortunately it's not, it's not as lucrative as it is in a lot of other sports so far. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, we still make a good living. There's, you know, I, I never in a million years when I was young, like I, I, you know, like Luke said, I said, I'm going to be a PBR world champion. But, you know, you don't, you don't really realize that you can make a living doing it. And it is a business to a certain aspect because it's how you make your living. But, like, I never looked at it. You know, if you go to looking at something like a job, then it turns into a job and you don't want to do it. And, you know, my sponsors, shoot, I've been fortunate over the years. You know, there's a couple of years I went without some and things like that, but I was pretty hard on them. You know, I, I would always say, you know, they would offer low ball you and I'd tell them, look, if you can't pay me what I can win at one event, I don't need you. I'm not wearing your shit all year for that. And that's just kind of how I went. That was what I set in my head. Copenhagen, they were really good. Uh, but I, I signed an agreement with them, you know, that they, I was exclusive. I only had – those were my only sponsors except for, you know, like the the corporate sponsors that the PBR had. I wore those patches. But as far as having multiple sponsors, I didn't. Copenhagen was strictly the only one. And Monster. Monster's really good. Like Mitch, it's funny. Mitch, I've had autograph signings and be walking out of the hotel to go to autograph signings and Mitch is like, where are you headed? Sign autographs for you, asshole. He's like, skip it. I'm like, okay. You know, <laughs> so like, you know, it, they're really cool. And, you know, when I, when I decided to rodeo this year, I, I, I called Mitch and I asked him, I said, you know, I said, if I decide not to go back to the PBR and just go rodeo, would y'all still want to sponsor me? And he told me, he said, as long as I'm working at Monster, you're a Monster guy, JV. And I said, perfect. So that you're calling your sponsor direct. There's no agent, never has been, never has been. I, I don't know. Yeah, this. I have agents. Uh, you know, XD Sports, Brad Benzinger, Sean Weesey, they, they handle all the fine-tuning and the legal parts. But, you know, like Mitch, I call him. I'm good, but, I mean, we're good buddies. And most of them – I talk to, I'm a little different than most, I guess, of their, their athletes, I guess. A lot of, you know, they get the, the sponsors for them. Like when I signed with them, I already had monster and the deal, the re I signed with them was because they said, well, if we bring it to the table, we'll work it. And, but if you already have it, we won't take a percentage, but we'll still work it for you. And I was like, okay. And so, like, I, you know, I work my own deals out a lot of times. Sometimes I'll, I'll call them, like, hey, we need to add a new patch to the vest. You know, they just give me pretty much free reign and let me do what I want to. <laughs> so, so uh, Luke was telling me a story about, uh, I guess, I was looking at the career stats here, and you said you had a bad year in, in 2011. You still won 200000 But in 2007, you won five hundred and seventy-five grand. finished third in the world standings. 2006, your first year in the PBR, you made 66,000. So when you make a half a million, you got some taxes to pay the next year though. And Luke said that was a oh. bit, a uh, bit of a bitch the next time or next year. Yeah, that was real bad. Like I was living high life. We was doing some drinking and we was doing some partying. And then my, 
accountant called me and told me how much I owed in taxes. And we were no longer doing a whole lot of drinking or partying because I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> well, we went to riding the shit out of more bulls, didn't we? <laughs> right. That's funny. That's all I remember about that conversation. He's like, I owe this much in taxes. So one thing's for sure, they ain't going to be able to throw me off a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the next year you go in uh, 477, finish second in the world. That was, uh, 08 was the year March. He won his first world title. Um, oh nine, you're second again to Cody Lostro, but win the world finals and you win 700,000 that year. That's uh that's a big one. Yeah, that, that was a big one. I rode, I was a, the only person to ever ride all the bulls at the PBR finals when they were eight, when it was eight rounds, seven rounds in a short round. I rode them all and I won the finals and I was still the maddest person in the whole place, you know, because Somebody said, man, that's a good job. I said, yeah, but it wasn't enough. I should have rode better throughout the year because I still ended up second. How uh, how close was it? I don't remember that year. One round. One round, that's it, eh? And Lostro fell off in the short round at 7.5. Did you think you, you had it that at that I point when he got bucked off, or do you remember? I I, I didn't look at it all week. I'm real. I'm real bad. Like I don't. I don't ever look at no averages. I don't look where anybody's sitting. I don't look where I'm sitting. I got a job to do every day, and that's what I'd show up and do. And you know, when when he got bucked off in the short round, and then I rode like I thought there was a chance. And when they called out, he was the world champion. I just I shook his hand. I turned around, and walked to the locker room. I was a mad son of a bitch. <laughs> and then once it was over with, you know, I called. I said, "How much difference was there? One round." Oh, damn that's a damn. kick in the nuts well and then yeah. you go then you go uh the next year your third 2010 was uh who the hell won it in 2010 i forget now one of the brazilian guys won it in 2010 did it was they? savano it's renato I'm pretty sure. renato, renato that's right yeah because yeah. savano won 11 12 then you got 13 14 might have been savano. Four, yeah that's right savano was 11 12 14 so uh so i guess i want to go next to like 20 well, I got I got two questions though. So, so you made seven point two million. What what have been some of the best investments over your career? Like to a guy that's maybe doing well now, moving forward. And and the one thing that a lot of folks might not know is that the PBR, the million dollar bonus, isn't paid out in one lump sum. You get a hundred thousand a year for ten years. So you got right now you got two hundred thousand a year guaranteed out of the out of those. That's kind of probably a nice bit to start with for before you hit the road each year too. Right now, isn't it? It is. You know you get it right at the end of the year, right? Round. Yeah. I can't remember. It came in not too long ago. Uh, it's in November sometimes when they send it and it's direct deposit straight into your account. And, you know, it kind of sets you up and, and I believe it's, it's pretty smart on their part to break it up a hundred thousand a year for 10 years. Some people say, well, that's bullshit. They ought to just give you a million, but somebody hands you a million dollars, you get in a higher tax bracket. You know, you're going to have to, sp- spend 350 of it paying it in taxes and and two i asked them why they did that and they said well if some 20 year old kid won the world we didn't want to what would you have done if we'd have handed you <laughs> like probably the same thing i did when i won it y'all gave me a hundred thousand blow it <laughs> and so you know i like the way it's set up it, it continuing to pay me I got a couple more years left of the, you know, the 200,000 and the first one runs out and I'll have a couple more years left of the hundred thousand, but it, it kind of sets you up. You can, you know, I don't know. The best thing I did was bought this land in Stephenville. You know, I sold my place in North Carolina. We moved South to where my wife's family was in Catula down South Texas. And then I didn't mind it down there. It wasn't bad. I liked it. Uh, her family was down there, but, you know, rodeoing, you were so far away from everything. And so we decided we wanted to, she's got a lot of friends around here too. And so I bought this place and usually I'm here. If you can't find me, I'm at home working, doing something, tearing up shit or messing with these bulls. But, you know, I want it. We got to build a house. Uh, we'll probably start that for too long. They've been, I've had welders here for, I don't know how many months now. We've been building bullpens and been through about three 
truckloads of pipe and I'm going to have to get another truckload for too long. But, but so the land, the land, and then like, you know, over the, over the years, was there, were there other things you put money into besides like there's been bulls UBF. over the years and yeah, the ultimate bullfighters as well. You guys, <laughs> you and Luke got that going, but, but I, I was curious though, like what, you know, as far as saving some cash here and there, like there's, there's uh that stuff's important to do over, over the years too, for, for guys that are. Uh, that um, weighs all cash away. That's why I had my bull trading bills and that's what Luke knows it. My cousins are horse traders and I always, you know, when I'd sell anything, well, here, I'll take 5,000 for it. You won't take any less? Well, I'll take 4,000 cash because there's no paper trail when that cash comes to you. And, so, <laughs> you know, that's how I am. I, I'm the same way selling bulls. Anything I got, a horse, you know, anything. You want to buy something from me? If I take 10,000, you won't take any less. Well, 8,500 cash and he's yours. <laughs> and, you know, that's just how I, I do it. I, I've always been that way and I, I do it. And I'm always squirreling cash back, but I put money in retirement deals and things like that. I can't, I looked at it the other day and I got quite a bit in there. So, you know, I tried to invest some of it. And, you know, the best thing around here right now, like Stephenville, it's gone crazy. Like the land here is high. If you come down here and you look at a 10 acre place and it's got a little house on it, you're looking at, you know, seven, 800,000. Easy. Damn. Like it's everything, killed. it's freaking high. And this place out here, it's it's 108 acres. And I could probably, with just a little bit of work I did and the cleaning up and stuff like that, I could probably easily double my money on this place right now if I want to turn around and sell it. How long ago did you buy it? The end of last year. Okay. So wow. we got to get into the UBF though now too. So you guys started this in 08. And then uh, um, it kind of um, stopped going for a little while. Like I guess not stopped going, but there was a bit of a bit of a break for it, kind of thing. And then came back in uh, in 2020. So you want to start off, Luke or or JB? You guys tell us about the UBF and and what you guys got got on the go right now. Even when even when JB and I were kids, like JB, I mean, he's like I told you, he worked every event, you know, in junior rodeos. And what a lot of people don't know, even at, at the high school rodeos and the junior high rodeos, he would he would fight bulls. So he was a bullfighter. And he talked about all the times working practice pins and you know, hanging out. We didn't have a we didn't have a bullfighter that was on call like, you know, you were you were helping this guy or you were helping that guy. Like <laughs> JB can fight bulls. I mean, JB can JB rides bulls good enough to know that when somebody's in trouble, like this is when you go, right? And I mean there's always been kind of a attraction to freestyle bullfighting, especially on the East coast. Cause there was never really a lot of it out there before we started the UBF 13 years ago. Um, and then last year, you know, with COVID and everything that happened, we decided to bring it back and, you know, give these guys somewhere to go. Cause they're, you know, they didn't really have anything going on with COVID and everything else. Um, and I mean, Chad Ellison, who's, who's our other partner in the UBF, he was like, what about JB? And it's a no brainer. I mean, he's, he's my oldest friend, you know, I've known him literally my entire life. And if I was going to do anything like this, like something with mean ass bulls and something that could be fun for us. And, you know, thinking about, you know, people ask me all the time, how long is JB going to ride bulls? And my answer is the same for everybody. As, as long as he fucking wants, like, I don't, I, I don't have any comment. I don't have any stipulate. I don't have any predictions. Like, He's going to do it as long as he wants. Like, you know, <laughs> he does what he wants. But when he decides he doesn't want to, this is something that he can that he can be a part of and it makes sense. You know, like, he's always going to have fucking bulls. He's, he always trades and works bulls. And with everything that the UBF's got going on now, especially in Texas, uh, really close to him, it's going to be fun. So that's kind of how that came about. I mean, it was kind of a no-brainer. I just – want to have a reason to get to hang out with my buddy and get to do something fun, you know, watch people get run over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was like, one of the cool things. Like with that, when we got the amount of time we had to spend around of that week in Fort Worth, like it is, it's pretty electric and watch people get run over. is pretty fun. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's what I love. Main bulls. Like 
I've got a few bulls here that are big pets that you can walk into the pen, hand feed them their hay and stuff. But most of them, like I show up with a load of bulls, everybody's done heard all these horror stories about how mean this shit is I got. And I mean, there's some in there that are pretty mean, but I keep them around. I like them with a little bit of heat to them. I got a couple that are gentle, but most of them, I, I like the heat. Well, talk about some of the bloodlines quick before we move on here. I'm curious on what do you got that way? Cause you, you'd be a, a master at some of that shit on who, on what there is to it and, and what you've got in the pen. Well, like, the set of calves I just weaned. See, Dale, Dale's partnered with me on all my rodeo cows. And I bought a bull from HD. Uh, shit, I can't remember. This is the second set of calves that I've got out of him. And Brandon Stewart has the one bull calf that we kept. And uh, they took him and entered him for charity the other day. But, um, He's a full brother to Crosswired. Uh, it goes by, you know, Crossfire Hurricane. And, but, you know, pages by far, in my opinion, have the best bloodlines going. Uh, now, the bull side, the big bulls, they, I bought them some sales, things like that. But Norris Dalton, uh, he's raised bulls forever. And he lives about two hours north of me. North Wichita Falls, and he's paralyzed. He's in a wheelchair. He's been in a wheelchair ever since I've known him. And, you know, over the years, he's kind of programmed. He's just – he hadn't had anywhere to haul his bulls, things like that. So he's got bulls up there that are four- or five-year-old bulls that's never had riders on them. And the guy that works for him, Nick, me and him pretty good buddy. So he called me. I went up there. We rode around. I wrote brands down and – that's where most of the big bulls that I have in these pens come from. The ones I was tipping today, they, there are eight new bulls and just Norris about a week ago. So, you know, they're, they're pretty much like Mavericks. Like they hadn't been handled a whole lot. You know, they've just been living in a pasture. He's got like 900 acres up there and they just pretty much run wild. They feed them, but you know, they, they branded them when they were calves and things like that. And then they've been out since. So it, it takes a lot of work and, to get them calm enough to where you can actually even get a guy on them. You know, there's, there's going to be probably three or four in this set that I got standing out here. It's going to be real bad, real, real bad. And, uh, but I like messing with them. I like piddling with them and, you know, taking them and working them and figuring them out and things like that. And, and there's some of these bulls that I picked up from him that you couldn't even hardly get the pin with them to feed them when I first got them here. And now you walk in there pour the feed in the bucket and they're standing right in front of you just right beside you waiting on you to pull the feed and it's crazy how much they gentle down when you work them and get them working i mean when you buck them they're still mean as hell but i just like pickles. well and you mentioned kind of being around them and i look i was i had this wrote down from a bit ago uh um you mentioned Lane Frost and Bull Talk, like his his uh, bull riding, um, like instructional video, I guess, kind of thing. I remember he mentioned uh, a lot of for a lot of for for his style. It was a lot of uh, um, it was just a little bit. He says just a little bit, probably about seven hundred times in that yeah. thing, because everything's a little <laughs> minor, minor adjustment. But that's, I think, like I want to go back to kind of who you learned from and modeled yourself after, but it's more. It's more that style than a Lefew, Gary Lefew kind of style, right? Like, it's more so the dance, the dance with the bull and being in the right spot. Than here's my, <laughs> there's your copy, <laughs> <laughs> right there. I still watch it all the time. My my son Jagger, he he watches it and like, you know, now I've got to where I, you know, I've watched it so many times. I just skip through to the riding parts, you know, just watch his rides and. uh but my little boy, he's he'll be three at the end of January. He'll sit in the bed and I mean watch him the whole time. Going through his gear, shoot procedure, on the horse, like he watches it, just eyes glued to it. And you know, that's the same way. Like I I, I didn't have Lane Frost Bull Talk when I was younger, but you can ask Luke, like I had a box of VH VHS tapes and 
you could point to any tape in that box, pull it out, stick it in, and I could tell you who it was riding, what bullet was, and what their score was, if they wrote them or not. And like I, I, I mean, the whole box didn't matter which tape you grabbed, you could grab it, and I'd be looking away, put it in, hit play, and I could tell you every ride on it, everything about it. And you know, that was a thing. My parents, they, you know, if if you studied, did your schoolwork half as much as you studied riding bulls, you'd be a straight A student. And <laughs> I was but, just about to say, he JB's never never been an A student on, on the academic level, but. I mean, he is, it's, his memory is photographic, like, he, I think I <laughs> what? I ain't think I passed high school, photographic. <laughs> photographic, I mean, ask him about a bull that he rode in 2006, I mean, like, there's been a lot in between, but, like, when he breaks down a bull riding, like, it's a, and I, I've made fun of him, I've made fun of him about this since he was eight years old, like, he, it's a 30 minute story because he, he, that detail, he breaks it down that much. But I mean, to be the best at something like you got to know all them details, you know, and that's, and that's what, that's what I tell young, young kids, like, you know, kids that, well, we've been working on it. We, we got on the drop barrel all week. And I'm like, y'all don't understand what working at it is. Like you have to eat, sleep, bull riding 24 seven. You, you would rather, watch bull riding tapes is to do anything else, ride a dirt bike or a four wheeler. Like that's all I wanted to do. Like I, I had dirt bike, things like that, but I mean, it stayed parked most of the time, unless I was outside and rode my barrel and got tired of riding my barrel then I'd ride my dirt bike around. But you know, it was always bull riding. Like there was nothing else. It was, you know, I rope did things like that, but it was, it was bull riding, strictly bull riding. And that's all I want to do. And, and I still do it to this day. Like I watch my rides back and break them down figure out what i did wrong and i'm too old and too crippled to get on 10 bulls a day like i used to (laughs) but you know i I try to get on the drop barrel and fix it but you know like young kids i'm like y'all would have never y'all wouldn't have lasted living with me for two weeks if y'all would have been my age because i'd have killed y'all off by the second day and that that's the difference in generations you know that i don't i don't understand it i guess they want to work more i'd rather ride bulls and make money than work but he was one of those guys i mean like when d when dvr started to be a thing i don't know when that was but i just remember i'd go to his house like i'd pick him up from the airport or we'd go back like when i started going to some of those events play concerts or whatever first thing we do we go back he dvr'd it and he'd watch he, he wouldn't just watch his ride. He'd watch a lot of people. Like, there'd be a certain ride he wanted to go back, and he'd watch it. He'd slow it down. He'd back it up. He'd play it. Then he'd back it up. He'd fucking slow it down. He'd play it. And then 10 more times, and he'd watch, you know. And, and I I never saw anybody break it down like that. And, I mean, think about it. I mean, it's it'd be like you guys going back and listening to your podcast, like, to, to make notes. It'd be like me going back. And listen, like I know I'm an I'm an announcer. It's not the same as riding bulls, but like I don't go back and listen to myself announce because you know it's stupid, right? But <laughs> but if you go back and do it, and same with music and any of that stuff, like go back and pick yourself apart, and make yourself better. But I mean, I mean, and he did that. I remember. I mean, I remember VHS tapes him riding steers going straight down the pin. He gonna watch it ten times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. Like, look at him. Look at him laughing. He knows. Like, he's. he But that's what he did. Like, because he, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got over to the left and did that. And then there's a ten minute story. He's gonna tell you why he went to the left. But I don't know, man. I mean, that's. It's not just a generational thing. That's what it takes to be great, you know. And I mean, it's it's that attention to detail, and it's it's pretty cool. But but it's important to to be good at anything. I think. What is what does the future look like for you, JB? As far as teaching guys, I, I'd be curious what it'd take to get it to get you to coaching some people, or what what does that look like? I remember listening to, to that deal with Flint as well, and you talked about having uh, Andrew Alvarez and Dalen Swearingen down at your place. And but one thing I really noticed was you weren't giving tips unless somebody asked you, which is I I appreciate that because I I don't 
feedback isn't uh, as appreciated if it's if it's uh, not asked for. Yeah, that's what I'm real big on that. They're like, well, you know, like college is right here. Tarleton College is right here, and I I ride over there and watch your practice and stuff every once in a while. And so I said, once you help them kids, I said they don't ask. And I said. I'll go watch, watch them get on bulls. I know exactly what they're doing wrong when I watch them. And if they come out and ask, I'll tell them. But if they don't ask, I'm not. It's no skin off my shoulders. You know, if they come and ask me, I'll help you out 110%. But if you don't ask, I'm not saying shit. And that's what Andrew, I hadn't been around Andrew a whole lot. He'd been around me some. And when he come to the house, you know, they were there and, we got on that drop barrel and rode in and I took him to a place and he, they got on some practice bulls and, you know, I watched him when they went to that team challenge and he did an interview and they said, uh, and they asked him something. He said, it is crazy. The amount of shit that guy knows about bull riding bulls. And there's a word that says, cause nobody asked me, you know, if you don't ask, I'm saying it. And, you know, you get to the level, the PBR level, you're riding bulls for a living. This is what you do for a living. So I'm not going to, you know, tell you what you need to be doing or what you did wrong. Like, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But, you know, that that's just how I am about everything. If you don't ask, and my wife gets pissed at me sometimes because she'll come up here and help me with these bulls and stuff, and I won't tell her what I'm doing. And she's <laughs> like, well, which way? And she's like, you don't communicate very good. I was like, well, you didn't ask. And... <laughs> So is there a, even if, if, can I ask for a, for a, 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 um, I guess you can't call it bull talk, but when, when's the JB Mooney, uh, uh, bull riding training video coming out? Talking well, about JB. <laughs> we've been, we've been, uh, we've been throwing it around. I've been talking to a buddy of mine about it, you know, and we, we were planning on doing it, but I don't know when we'll end up doing it. I gotta, you know, whenever he kind of decides we get everything lined up. That's, I would rather do that as to put on board riding schools because I put on a few and what I've noticed about a few of them is, or most of them, you know, you got, say you got 15 kids there, uh, five of them there because their parents are living through them. Uh, then you've got eight that are there just say they came to your school. And then you might have one or two that will actually really want to learn and really want to ride bulls. And, and I don't have a very good filter. So when I look at a kid that's 14 years old and his parents are standing there and I say, Hey man, you're a pussy. You need to quit. <laughs> like, <die. laughs> like, you know, then the parents fucking hate me and say, I'm, you know, but I don't have a good filter. I mean, this isn't all crazy. hypothetical. This is all stuff that's actually happened in real life, sadly. I say what I feel. I say what I think. And it, it's hard for me. And in other aspects, too, like, yeah, if you put a board out in school, on, each student paid the same amount of money to be there. Well, this kid that just shows up, just say he went to your school that's, not ever going to make it riding bulls. You can tell right off the bat. Why do I want to try to help him when he's not ever really going to do it? Is the same as I'm going to help the kid that's really trying his guts out that really wants to do it. Like I, I just, I can't, I mean, I'll help them, but it just, I don't like doing bull riding schools like at all whatsoever. And I, I've had, I get people messages all the time want me to do bull riding schools and I won't do them. So if you're not doing schools though, how, how do you think uh, the young athletes need to mentally prepare for the sport? Just on a, on a side note of things, if you, if you're not doing schools, like would you do private stuff for people if they're, if it's I've the thought, kid reaching I've, out or. I've thought about doing that. You know, I've thought about doing that, taking like one person at a time and working with them because, you know, you get 15 people there together and the way I always started schools off, you know, some people, they work on the barrel, they do this. I put them on bulls. As soon as we got to the school and they got their shit on, I put them on bulls. And everybody said, why do you do that? I said, see what I got to work with. 
you know, I can't tell how good this kid rides until he gets on something in front of me. You know, I don't know what I'm working with until I see it. And then you can kind of, you know, separate them out to where this kid needs to ride the drop barrel. This one needs to work on shoot procedure. You know, you can kind of, but I've thought about taking, like, if somebody really wanted to come and do it, but they won't like me, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> it needs to be, it needs to be a one on one deal. Like, you come live with JB for two weeks. And if you can handle the ass chewing, if you can handle getting tortured, you'll, you'll probably know quite a bit about bull riding. You might even be better at riding bulls than when you got there. And hell, we might give you 10,000 because nobody else wants to do it. They're scared of the guy. Through <laughs> it could be a reality show. Two yeah, weeks there you go. go. <laughs> I, I watch it. I watch it every week. You, you can ask Luke. There, there's a guy in North Carolina and Eli Miller. He called me up. Hey, man, if I come help you around the house, will you help me riding bulls? I said, yeah, but you're not going to like me. And, you know, he didn't know what I was talking about. And you want to talk about the ass chewings I gave that son of a gun. And, like, he would show up and I'd be like, hey, you got your rigging bag with you? Yeah. All right, get your vest, your helmet, your bull rope, and your gloves. Why not my whole bag? Leave your boots and spurs here. We're going to get on bulls. You're getting on your tennis shoes. Like, I wouldn't tell him we were doing it that day. Like, he showed up, and that's what we did. I went. And you talk about – there's another kid that did it one day, too. And because there's an older man over there that's got some bulls that if you ride bulls, you wouldn't fall off of any of them. And he fell off, and he was trying to hide it. He didn't want to show me the video. And – Somebody finally sent it to me, and I asked him about it, and he's like, yeah. And I said, get your rope and stuff. And I said, leave your boots and spurs. He said, why? And I had a spotted bull. I used to get on him all the time, tennis shoes, no vest, shit like that. And, but he would hook your ass sometimes. And so I told him, I said, I, I was crippled. I broke my leg or something. I was still riding, but my leg was broke. So we go. We load this son of a gun up. I pull his rope. He's getting ready. I stepped down there to trip the latch and I said, Hey, by the way, you better ride good and get off good. Why? I said, my leg broke and I ain't getting run over. So you're on your own when this gate flies open and you <laughs> talk about the gun, gun was scared shitless. Rode the piss out of him. Just perfect. Stepped off on his feet. And I said, see, I said, when you don't have anyone to rely on or anything to rely on, you do shit right. It's a little hard knocks with JB. Shit. So, so getting on in tennis shoes though, that I remember t- hearing about that. I, I never did it. I wasn't that good, but I mean, like I never, I never did that shit, but that, how, how important is that? Like, I feel like tennis shoes would give the guy a little bit of like, they'd be kind of sticky. Like you could kind of stick to them, but, but bull riding is more like a lot of it's, a lot of it's your knees. Like as long as, as long as your, your legs aren't straight down the sides of them, if you got some knees in them, that's, that's a, what a guy needs a lot of, right? Yeah. A lot of knee. You can tell like I, I the reason I do it, like if I feel like I'm riding tight and not moving, that's when I do it. I'll take them spurs off and I'll get on the tennis shoes. It makes me, you know, your feet will slide more and you'll have to, you constantly have to reset them. Just keep setting them back down there. They will get a hold a little bit, but like they'll still like they, it's not like having a spur on. And you know, I, I've I've done that a lot to guys. They the high school association in North Carolina asked me to do a, a little one day school for them the four that were going to the nationals that year. And like I told them, they'd screwed up anyways. I said the guy that was bringing bulls, he'd bring nineteen pointers there. And I said, they're getting the, getting on weak bulls and you're going to send them to the nationals expecting them to do something good. And they're going to get cow killed out there because they hadn't been on bulls that buck like that ever. And so they wanted to do it at that guy's house with the 19 point bulls. So when I get there, these kids are strapped up, got their boots, spurs on, they're ready. I looked at all of them. I said, y'all got tennis shoes with you? Yeah. I said, go put them on. They said, why? I said, you want to learn how to ride bulls? Don't rely on those spurs. I said, but I will tell you, if you screw up, they're going to knock the shit out of you. Cause <laughs> me, I whip behind you real, like real fast. If you're not sitting exactly where you need to be and resetting your feet, then they will whip you down. Like a 19 point bullet jumps, kicks can whoop you down pretty quick. Like, so 
Damn. That's why I always did it. It made me feel like I'd go back to moving and shuffling and not just trying to clamp and get one good hold. So, so, uh, is that one of the, is that one of the keys as far as being in the right place and, and, and getting the feel for it and being able to get over the front end correctly? Like, is it, it you, you, you can't, you can't stick your feet in the rope and think you're going to stay on everything. They're going to tear the shit out of you anyways. But I mean, like that's a, that's a big part of it, right? Like if somebody's starting out and wants to get better at it, is, is that a, you know, if they're just starting out, do not get on with tennis. Yeah. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is advanced training. This is, this is uh, a yeah. level, level two, at least. You know, it, it is, it's all about being in the right place. It's, it's like a dance, you know, the bull moves and you got to follow. I mean, it, it's, but, I, I, it's, I don't know. I just, I use a lot more knees, but you still use your spurs at the same time somewhat. And I always, you know, the people that I would tell to get on the 10th shoes been riding bulls, you know, it wasn't yeah. like they, they'd been riding bulls and, you know, you can watch somebody ride and tell if they're just clamping down with their feet and just trying to hang on to them instead of moving like you're supposed to. I was, I, I was taught you ride bulls like you ride a, a bicycle constantly moving your feet you never take a hold you know if you if you feel like you got a good hold reset them and you know that that's just that's my thought on it and like the shoe procedure most people don't get along with me about that you know they want to get up there sit down on the bull rope and waller around and i'm like what are you doing well i'm getting getting a good seat i said for what it's about to change as soon as you nod your head yeah fair enough the uh uh, I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get into like the technical side of on the bull ride side of it. One, one thing we talked about in Fort Worth was the lead changes with the bulls and, and being able to see those lead changes with the bullfighters and, and knowing which way a bull was going to go. And I never got to a point where I could notice that. I don't know, Wacy, if, if you did, if you knew it, like uh, as far as lead change, but like, I was lucky. I was lucky enough to ride horses as much as I did. That's something that eventually became like riding horses is so big. Like we're learning those lead changes, but once I, Belted riding bulls is a complete game changer. Oh, yeah. You, you can feel them bulls rolling their shoulders, things like that. Like, all these bulls that I get that haven't ever had riders on them or haven't been bucked and things like that, I have to do the same thing with them. Like, the first time I take them and mess with them, like, I'll spill them out of a shoot. The first thing I watch is which foot they're hitting first with, which lead they're on. You know, if they're on their left lead, they probably need to be on the left side. You know, if they're on the right lead, then they probably need to try them on the right hand side. Like I always pay attention to stuff like that, but it's, you know, and I worked a bunch of cast for a guy one time and never been bugged, things like that. And that's what I did. I had my wife video them. And like Luke said, I'd go back and watch them 10 times, slow it down and watch. And that's how I'd figure out, you know, well, maybe I need to put him on the left hand delivery. He's on his left lead. And, you just got to – that's why I like working bulls. You got to fiddle with them. And and I've always told guys that ride bulls, if you want to get better, then go work bulls. Get a job at a sale barn. Go work. Understand how they move. Understand how to move around them. And then, you you know, even when you ride bulls sometimes, if you had never – if you, you can be a bull rider for 10 years, but if you've never really been around them, you're still a little scared of them. And – Or terrified. Like, yeah. I mean, I feel like if you go and, like, you work them and you handle them, you learn how they move, how to step around the end of the gate and let them go by you and things like that, then you're not scared of them. You know how they move. And I think that makes you a better bull rider because, you know, you kind of understand them a little better. So uh, before we wrap up here, I'm, we're probably keeping you way too long, but I want to I want to ask you about, uh, about Jagger. He's uh... – He's uh, how long until he uh gets past you in uh, in Instagram followers? He's not too far no. behind. No, he's he's a popular little fella. <laughs> what do you want to see I, him I, do when he grows up, though? What's he? What do you want? What do you want that your your son your clone to do when he when he grows up? Whatever he wants to do, you know. I, I that's what I, I you know. Everybody said, "Oh, next world champion bull rider." I said, if he wants to ride bulls, that's fine by me. That's all on him. That's his decision. It, you know, some days he's got a spring bull, and like I mean that he pays attention too. Like I'll give him that. Like he'll ride that spring bull, and then you know some days he in there and he's 
backing in the box. He said, Dad, I'm in the box. And he'll take his rope and flip it up under his arm like he's tucking it under his arm in the box. And I asked Samantha, my wife, I was like, did you teach him how to tuck it under his arm? She said, no. And so, like, <laughs> he pays attention to everything. And he'll back it in there and he'll rope the little dummy and everything. So some days he's a roper. Some days he's a bull rider. Today he was butt naked with his cowboy hat on, uh, had his plastic pistol in his holster. And for a while he was Newt. And then for a while he was Gus. <laughs> he the pony around. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's whatever he wants to do. I, I bought him a little T-ball deal, a little bat and a ball, and, you know. And he hits it pretty good. Like, actually, I told him, I said, I gave him the bat, showed him how to hold it. And I stood in there, and I said, now look at the ball and hit it. And he freaking whacked it. And I said, well, I played baseball when I was younger. Maybe I should have stuck with that. <laughs> how fun has it been to be on the road with them? You had, you had basically, you said earlier, you got to spend the summer on the road with your family and, and having your having your little son up there and your wife. Like how, Like, how fun was that? Oh, it's a blast, you know. I was going to those bull ridings and, you know, fly in, fly out every weekend. And it, it's hard on him to, you know, flying all the time, getting a rental car, things like that. You know, when we bought the RV and we hit the road, you know, they're right there with me. And it, it was fun. You know, we have days off. We'd go to a campground and play and do whatever the hell we wanted to. And, you know, he, he's all about as long as he can be around daddy, he's okay. Like, he didn't much like going to the bull ridings and having to sit in the stands like that pissed him off. Like he didn't like that, but you know, those rodeos, he just goes back there with me and stays with me until I have to ride. And, and, you know, it, it was cool. It's, it's kind of funny watching, you know, there's a couple of times that bull step on my step on me at, in Washington, uh, towards the end of the summer. And it split me up open pretty bad, knocked me out. And that's what the next morning they, was looking at me and I said, you okay, buddy? He said, yeah. He said, have blood everywhere, daddy. I said, yeah, they got it all stopped. Though. They got it sewed up. He said, yeah. I said, good thing your daddy's tough, huh? Yeah. That bull step on your face. I said, yeah, he did. <laughs> what, uh, what, what do the next few years look like? What's the, what's the plan moving forward here? Well, I think I'm going to take probably January and February off and then I'm on, well, I'll enter San Antonio, but, uh, I'm going to, Start back around San Antonio or Houston and go rodeo again. Yeah. Get, uh, I guess, kind of heal up for a little while and get get uh, back to 100% or I guess 100 ish, like how yeah. as good as you can feel after a month off. My 100%, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and then, but like picking up is probably going to be on the on the radar here in the future and, and like taking the bulls around. Like you're, you're a rodeo guy for, for life. Like you're a lifer. Like this is. This oh is, yeah, this is I like, what you're doing. I like picking up Bronx. That, that's pretty damn fun. Uh, I like messing with those fighting bulls, and I like piddling with these bulls and stuff like that. Like I'm always, it's always something to do with bulls. Always, most of the time a rodeo. You know that. That's how it's going to be probably the rest of my life until I can't do it anymore. I like it, Wacy. I guess one more question before we wrap it yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the time, man. This has been awesome. Or, or a good way to wrap up the year for us. So. The one question we ask all of our guests on the show, what is your definition of cowboy shit? I think we've covered a lot of cowboy shit through the show, but what is your definition of cowboy shit? Being a tough son of a bitch. It's going to be a bad <laughs> Might as well be a grizzly. There you have it. That's perfect. That's one that I like that. I like that one. It's one of our better ones we've had over the years. So, Luke, you got anything else to throw in here before we wrap it up? Nothing, man. I just, I get to watch, uh, I get to watch bull riding every week and I have for, for 15 years and that that's partly because of this guy i mean his uh his love of the game is pretty infectious you know um uh, like 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 we said <laughs> my bull riding career was laughable at best you know but <laughs> but like his his knowledge and, and the love that he has for it it's it's contagious you know um the first billboard tough event i ever went to he bought my plane ticket for he said you got to come out here and that was when i wanted to be a musician you know he just come hang out like bull riding like it's awesome it's cool you know and that's the first place i met flint it's the first place i met brandon bates and now i now i work with him every week you know uh it's pretty cool i i owe i owe a lot in in my career to this guy and i think a lot of people do just getting to watch him ride red gas bulls you know so 
everybody's pretty fortunate to have have this slap dick be a part of their life. <laughs> one of the OG slap dicks. <laughs> Again, Luke Kaufman and the two-time PBR world champion, JB Mooney. Thanks for joining us here today. We appreciate it a lot. Shit, that's why he uh, his <laughs> fire alarm once again. As you excuse may have, my, excuse my language, as you may have heard in the top of the show. But again, uh, great interview with JB. Um, one thing I got to point out, and thanks to Luke Coffin for joining in as well. Uh, one thing I was surprised by is the I had in my head the whole time that JB had a bad NFR because of his, you know, gets knocked out in the second round. Yeah. But I didn't know he tore his groin too. So, anyways, like. I it's cool. It's I, cool to hear it right from the horse's mouth, though, right? Like people or he said can his make, head's can... not. But but then again, like I, I want to. I wonder if he didn't realize that it was hindering him too, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, may, maybe. I think that's one of the shitty things with the brain injuries is that we don't know we're brain injured and and we think we're still okay. So yeah, I still right. I still wonder though if that's but that's something that goes back to other tra- problems where he could go win. 200,000 that week. Yeah. And yeah. there's no, if he doesn't get on because of his own choice or because of an association choice, he doesn't get anything. So mm-hmm. still, a, uh, I think it's there, I think there's more to that still, even if that wasn't the case, there's a few but layers to protect our people. Yeah. Yeah. Got to well, you, you, got, you look at any other sport with that right. kind of stuff, like they're, they're like hockey, football, whatever, like they're doing their best to protect their, their top guys. Cause they're nothing without those top guys. So, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, there's, I think it, it boils down to less of the more on it's just needs more needs to fall on the, the association, the people looking after their athletes to, to do a better job of taking care of their guys. So even with, <laughs> even with him saying he's okay, I still don't, I still don't know if that's actually the case. Um, and I think that, the PSA it's, it's, and JB both missed a big opportunity to focus on brain injuries there. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. then again, it's not on him. It's on the association and, but they don't have anything in place to pay no. him if you can't get on. So it's That's just it, man. It's, a shitty it's part kind of, of things still that still needs to get figured out. We've made, yeah, we made some steps in the right direction, but there's definitely mm-hmm. a long way to go still. Uh, and that was evident with how that went down with him. But yeah, like you said, great interview is cool. Cool to, uh, to get a chance to talk to him and talk yeah. about some fun stuff and hear about just the way this, the way he thinks about, stuff right like yeah and even like how he approached the game like it's it, it's a different level than most people ever will or ever have done it so it's it's pretty neat to see well one thing i got thinking about like I, I laid awake last night for quite a while after we did that show and i wondered about like about asking him do you wish you would have went to the prca years earlier uh do you think you could have won more world titles there than in the pbr do you think that you might have enjoyed it more after a while in the PBR, do you think you would, uh, you probably wouldn't have won more money. You wouldn't have got the, you know, hundred thousand a year for however long. So yeah. you wouldn't be 7 million. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, I'm going to look here quick. What, if there's a stat on Sage, like what he's won. He's got to be close, like approaching five. You would say. Yeah. I actually don't know. I'm yeah. curious. I'm just going to see if it, if the PRC has these stats, I don't think they have quite as honestly sophisticated of a yeah system career earnings 2.5 million he's won the world pbr or the prc world title seven times he won two and a half million um that doesn't include anything from calgary or the american so he's probably won three 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 and a half probably three point two but he's won the world seven times so so i guess um i I guess the one the one thing i did one takeaway i could take from that though is when he he asked jw hart or uh, jerome davis jerome davis sorry um he asked jerome davis like 
what's the best way to make a living around the Bulls? He said, go to the P or J- Jerome Davis asked him, you want to make a living around the Bulls? He said, go to the PBR. So mm-hmm. I think that's maybe where he, that's why he stuck with the PBR just to make, be able to make that living and, and set himself up for success, I guess. I don't I don't, that's yeah. the only thing way I can think of it. I don't know. Cause he I mean, it's just, almost, it's almost three times as much as far as Sage on the, on the, uh, money run PRCA yeah. side of things. You can, you can add in the, uh, you know, you could add in those other couple things, but, but yeah. even, even, JB saying, uh, I think he said he figured Brian Canner was the best bull rider ever as far as guys riding, but mm. you can't, but as far as, uh, as far as like differentiating who's the best, you, you kind of still have to be Donnie Gay based on eight world titles. Yeah. But yeah. if you base it on, you know, PBR career earnings. career earnings, or if you base it on, you know, titles, best bull rides, I, I it's, uh, it's interesting. I, yeah. I it makes me want to, makes me think a bit more about it. So there's, there's the whole, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different factors and stuff that play into the, that conversation of who the best ever is. And, and then you have the PBR, PRCA debates and all kind of stuff. Like there's a lot of factors into it. That's for sure. So or if you're going strictly off, kinda... t- if you're going strictly off titles one, man, it's, 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 it's the answer is clear, right? This is kind of wild too. So, uh, Kimsey has made 788,000 in the PBR, which is kind of wild. There you go. That's a lot of money. PBR yes. Canada. So that Calgary money counts there in 2019 winning Calgary's mm. 80,000. So does 2015 uh, touring pro hundred thousand, 500,000 is the American. That's wild. That's interesting. So he won Calgary and the American that's year. He won a million bucks in one year, 2017. Nice. So, so uh, Sage that makes him uh three and a half, but uh, Kimsey's at um, seven or Jamie's sorry. He's at seven. Yeah. At so seven it's half. And, JB's 34 and Sage is 27. So, but most, most JB's earnings came in the first part or the first 10 years of his career. He hasn't won as much in the last few years, honestly. Right. And, and I was surprised by the, um, well, I mean, like he was in the hunt for a world title in 2017, then gets wrecked out in Calgary again. Oh, he was how he was, he kind of picked up right where he left off and even he was riding so good. I was looking at, just like, yeah, like he said, it was a career, it wasn't career ending, but, Honestly, should have. most guys probably would have. Well, and, but if you look at it, like he didn't even ride the second half of the year till he got, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, didn't ride the second half of the year, still finished 16th in the world. But it, it is look at these career stats. So he was top 10 in the world from uh, 2007 all the way till uh, 2016. He's only, he finished uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. He had seven seasons where he was third or better in the world standings. Wow. Right. Two years, uh, 11 and 12, he was seventh and eighth. But to be top three in the world, seven seasons out of 10 is pretty unbelievable. Pretty badass. So, but then, so that's the caliber of guy he was, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he's 34. So say 2021, he's 34. 2020, uh, he's 33. 32 in 2019, 31 in 2018 and 30 in 2017. So the years after 30, he's finished, well, 30 and above. He's been 16th, 28th, 30th, 28th, and then 2021, he was 232nd. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he did make his way on the PRCA side of things where, as we've discussed before, the you know the caliber of the Bulls isn't as consistently high everywhere. Yeah. So he can, he can be at a high level at those mm-hmm. events still, honestly. Well, you win a lot more money off the 84 to 87 yeah. point bull rides well, the, the PRCA level, right? The Whereas 85 the PB- and below. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, exactly. Even 85 and below. Whereas the PBR, you, you got to be in a, over 87 to be even in, like placing in rounds, right? Mm-hmm. From sometimes even higher. So it's it's kind of just there's that drop off, which is, I mean, works. And, J, and J, I mean, JB still had to step up to the plate and ride the bulls he did. So, I mean, like kudos to him, but it definitely is a, the bull power level is a bit different, I would say. Well, so here's, Ellensburg, he was 83. Fort Madison, where he got hurt, was 90. Won the, won the round of the NFR, 87 and a half. 85, 87 and a half, 85 and a half, 91. Well, look at, uh, look 77 at the one round where... in Elko, won money with a 77, probably. Look at the round where in the NFR, where it wasn't Josh Frost like 52 points or something like that. I want a shitload of money, shitload of money where it's like that would never happen at a PBR. 82 in Reno. He was 90 back to back in Hugo and Weatherford. Um, 88, 89 and a half, 77 in Bandera on a bull with no name. Mm-hmm. How, how often does that happen where he gets on two bulls bull. here? Mercedes, Texas, just number bulls. bulls. No name. Yeah. Just number bulls. Eh? Isn't that wild? Yeah. 
Yeah, 90 in Del Rio. That was a big one. 64. Doesn't look like he took a reride in Mineral Wells. Just got a 64. Wonder where probably he ended pulled, up. Probably pulled a check there too, though, right? Well, I wonder here. Uh, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, sixth place. 64 points. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, and I'm, I'm not crapping on anybody here. No, you still got to ride your bulls, man. You know, still makes a couple rides, but like 80 here in Mercedes, 83, 83, 86 and a half, 87, 81 and a half, 85 and a half. 83 and a half, 81 and a half. Yeah. A few but just of like, TBR side of things. Arlington. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, it just shows the, just like, the, it, you're never going to place with a 64 point ride at a PBR, right? No. Whereas, or you where, and, which, and that's, and that's just the way it is. Like, it's fine. Like, you still got to show up and ride that 64 point bull, which sometimes can be harder than a 85 point or some, in some aspects for some guys. So, I mean, I guess definitely. Yeah. What, what I'm kind of, what I wanted to point out though, is that like after that wreck in Calgary, which I didn't realize the impact, but he hasn't ridden the at same. the same elite level since. Well, and the one thing that the career ending, st- but it was career altering. The one thing that really stood out to me when he mentioned it was how he lost his free arm out of it. And I thought mm-hmm. back more and you look back at some of those big rides he made, like when he rode asteroid with his rope, I mean, it's like his, ro- with his hand out of the rope the last couple seconds, like his big moves he's making with his free arm is what saved him on that bull. Or a lot of those guys, like a, <clears throat> a lot of those big rides he made, like it was, because he made miraculous recoveries or big arm, big big moves with free arms to get right back into position. So I mean, losing that for losing that part of your game for a guy like him, which has been such a big part of it, it could it definitely it's it's a no wonder why it was career career altering, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I uh, I don't I'm not sure what my point was. I just think that it it changed the path a little bit. You know, on track mm-hmm. to maybe win a third world title in 17, get hurt in July, miss mm-hmm. the second half. You know. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just it kind of just a of testament the, to, the, the to the sport, you know? Yeah. Just, that's just the way she goes. And I mean, kudos to JB for adapting and saying, and saying at it, right. Like, I mean, it would have been, it would have been easy for him just to say, okay, you know what? That's it for me. And, but he kept going and, mm-hmm. and he accomplished another dream of his by making the NFR. So going NFR, like, yeah. Yeah. So good for him. Yeah. I, I mean, like in, in his position too, like it had to have been so fun to like he, and he said it too, like traveling around with his family and his little boy, like, Oh yeah, that's, guys. At that point, when you have your family, that's that's the one thing that they love to do. And I know even back in the day when we were old enough to go rodeoing with my dad, like we all went, jumped in the van, and there was a crew of us in the van with all of it. And he he loved it more than anything. We spent one year, the year two thousand, we spent uh, two thousand two thousand one, we spent uh, ten days in a truck camper with all of my whole family at the Calgary Stampede. My dad was competing there, and I know he he liked that more than anything. So I mean, can see why that would be be a lot more fun than having to fly around everywhere every weekend so definitely yeah yeah man that's sweet like that he only went interview. to about 55 rodeos too which is on the lower end yeah we get, oh, we get guys. some guys who rodeo themselves out well even like the greatest ever conversation makes me wonder and i think we've talked about this before but but uh you look at the greatest ever and donny gay had his own plane so he flew himself everywhere he wanted to go mm-hmm and could rodeo his way through it right you know he could he could out rodeo guys by going to more places so i wonder yeah. if there was you know he still showed up and rode like you're saying but i wonder how much they're going to more rodeos than everybody it made a difference yeah yeah you no know, i wonder how much i wonder what if that really you know the greatest everything like we've we've built on here previously yeah I don't know. I don't yeah, know. It's, it's a question that make me think about, and I, but yeah. I don't know how to. Oh, and then to even we, we go back to our conversation with Jake Bull, where it's like he wanted to go to the least amount of rodeos possible and make, make the most amount of money as he could. And it's, yeah, make it's, a living it's at it. Just different strategies for different guys. And I mean, and maybe that's what worked for Donnie. He needs to get on that many bulls to stay at that level. Whereas for Jay, a guy like Jake, like when he was going, like he needed to, didn't need to go to as many rodeos to to be at that high level. So I mean. I think it just whatever works for each individual guy, but yeah, it definitely factors in a lot to the best ever conversation. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see what we can come up with for that. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, So I got 26 events already for Sage in 2021 and I counted about 50 for JB, but then Sage has another entire page. Yeah. The other one. So as a Sage, well, Sage is, isn't, he's traditionally a guy who gets to his rodeo count. Like he makes sure he goes to as many as he can get to. Right. I'm at 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. Here, keep going for a while. I'm going to count. Okay. Uh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I bet you no. Sage went to like more like 80. Yeah. Because I know in the past, there's, there's a couple of years where he went, he, he, he rodeo out and get to that point. So he, and, and that's, and that's where a lot of his big leads have came from maybe too. But 
yeah, yeah. I'm not think, taking I away it, anything from no no you, you, you're allowed to go that many rodeos so freaking you may as well go if you can or if you're capable right so but it just it, yeah. it, it's one of those things where it's just yeah okay whatever just works for each individual guy what you need to do because i mean jb's the kind of guy where he can be hurt for two months and come back and smash out two 90 point rides in a row right whereas maybe some guys it just doesn't work for them so i mean you just gotta find the the as our good friend doug young likes to say all the time you gotta find the you gotta get your mixture right and find what mixture works for you so i mean well, yeah, and I, I wonder, I'm looking, I looked at the, the, the numbers too. So Sage has got, uh, 986 total records on pro bowl stats. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually going by like money per bowl, then, um, JB is still one more. Cause as far on the pro bowl stats side of things, he has like 1600 records. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a, you know, how many more bulls do you get on in, in from 27 to 34 where, I mean, that's a conversation we can have when, when they get to that point too. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's interesting. Cause like, cause you get, you put another 900 records on Kimsey's, uh, you know, I don't know if he'll have that many more in the next seven mm -hmm. years, but you give him, you give him another 700 to get to where JB is. Maybe does he win another three and a half million, but I think the, the transition, if he got, if he, you know, gets to eight or nine or 10 in the PRCA, he's got three more, three more years to be 30. And then does he, is he still in good enough shape to go to the PBR and contend there? I, I, I don't know. I think, I think you'd get maybe, a, I, and I don't know if it's a fair comparison or not, but it's JW Harris type of deal where like JW one still, year kind of thing. Yeah. JW is still a really good bull rider when he came over to the PBR, but he just, I think he was at the, the back nine of his career and it's tough to go compete at that level all the time where he, and he had two really good seasons in the PBR. So, I mean, it's tough to say, man. And he won four and, world titles in the PRCA. Yeah. Oh. We're gonna it'll be, it'll be cool to see, off. man. It'll be Sorry. cool to see. But anyways, yeah, we can we could definitely say something def a topic we definitely revisit often. We I'm sure we will more in the future. Mm -hmm. I like the chat. Like even when we were when we were going uh to and from Herbert for Christmas, I was listening to some podcasts, mm -hmm. listening to a couple of Flint shows, be just for something to to make me think while we're driving. I was getting bored of driving and just wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. have the conversation instead of music. I just don't I'm not as uh mentally stimulated by the music side of things sometimes so i appreciate the conversation and i hope that folks listening will think i think about these things as well with us and mm -hmm. give us mm -hmm. a shout but man i think some of the we got to do a quick uh think thought bit of recap on the year just some of the yeah man things, it was uh, a hell of it was a hell of a year man like yeah we still have covid graduated but... university we still battled covid we still got to do some cool stuff got to mm -hmm. my brother got married some of my really close friends got married mm -hmm. um yeah, it's been a, it's been a heck of yeah, a year. Trip the, to Newfoundland was pretty. Trip epic. Newfoundland was awesome. Good we got to do some rodeoing again. Yep. Um, obviously, we, we've had some success with the show. I mean, we passed we were over two hundred thousand downloads all time now, which is pretty cool. Clothing brands doing well, which is I'm sure like I, I for can, all the support. I, thank people. you. Yeah, we, we and then yeah, that's kind of where I was going. Whereas like, it's become a lot bigger than I think any of us would have expected, and um, it would have couldn't have been possible without everybody who supports us and listens to us. So we appreciate it more than I think people really know. It's one of those things too, where I like, I have friends who will talk to me and they're like, Oh yeah, you're like, so you're famous, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, like that's, you're not famous at all. It just, and I, and I like, that's not the motive either. Whereas I think like, I, I, I love doing it and I know you do too, Ted and, and storm. Like she, I'm, she, I'm sure she does too. And I mean, everybody in, involved like Sean and, and anybody. So, I mean, it's just cool to be able to give something back to, a sport and industry that's given us so much or for me like it's like everything a lot of stuff a lot of who i am today is because of rodeo and the people i've met and through that so be able to share stories and kind of give back and in a way that works for us it's really cool to be part of that so i mean it's been a been a cool year and, and then you add in the whole live show layer like being able to go to the cfr um aggribition texas man like that's the our texas trip was the highlight of the year for me in, in regards to all this kind of stuff like it was really cool to something really new for both of us, like doing that pre-show stuff. It, it kind of felt like we were actually on TV, which was really neat and learning about <laughs> a new sport and, and kind of challenging our skill set and, and, and learning something new and, and, and kind of adding to another something new to the tool belt. So, I mean, that was really cool. And then, and then just being back in Texas and in America and traveling around and having some fun. It, it was, it was cool, man. It. Yeah. How was you, dude? What's, what's your kind of summation of 2021? Um, it was, I enjoyed golfing up until, uh june and then up until, we were... I, up until I didn't enjoy golfing yeah till i saw i got so i got so sour on golf by the end of the year man. <laughs> oh fuck i hated it and then uh then we worked our asses off until 
Mm-hmm. Um, I guess basically December 20th or so. Yeah, literally. Uh, and here we are now, kind of right back to it. Uh, get after it for next year. But yeah. That we're two, week, two weeks from now, we're in Texas. Or two weeks from tomorrow, I guess. We're in Texas today. again. Well, you were a day, day later, but yeah, we're two weeks today. So yeah, that was cool. I mean, I think it we got to touch on Jose being 98.75, like almost. It's cool. I'm so pumped that they finally broke the record, man. I'm, I'm pumped that yeah. finally happened. That's that's good to see. And looking and back, I don't all think well that, deserved. looking back, I don't think that JB's ride on Bushwhacker is deserving of 100 points or 99 points. I don't think it was good enough. It was hard, but I don't and think his, it's, his ride on Pearl Harbor to me is one of the that one rides of all time, dude. That yeah, was that a one. bull ride. But then you can also <clears throat> look back at like uh, Cooper Davis on uh, on uh, oh, what the hell is that bull? Smooth, that smooth operator, smooth we're operator, Brandon. Yeah, 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 right. So, so I mean, yeah, I'm glad they got this one right. There might I think, be I think, I think now that they've broken the ice though with that, like with Jose, I think we're gonna see a lot more of those big time rides get the scores that they deserve to get. So. And I'm still going to, I'm going to die on the hill that before Jose is done and done his prime, he is going to be a hundred points. Oh, well, but listening to a show, well, one of Flint shows with Cody Lambert, Cody says that, and he's the judging guy. Like he's the guy, mm. he says that a bull can't be perfect. Can't be a 25 point score unless he throws a guy off. So with that being said, we're never going to see a hundred in the PBR until just, that thought changes. I just, and, I, and I think it will though. Cause it that, like was Jose was the first one ever to have a perfect rider score. So, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's, I think it's but, unlikely. It's unlikely, but it's, I think it's possible, man. That's just, that's but, my, like personally, I think he's going to do it. But did you hear the point where I said, Cody Lambert teaches the judging seminars and right. he says a bolt isn't a 25 unless you throw it. I mean, it's, and that's, off. but it's not, and it's not, but things change too. Right. It's not, it's not, it's not saying it's, I don't think I'd, there'll I'd, be a hundred. If Cody's still in charge of the judging seminars, if the, if the rule is, from his standards and mm-hmm. he's the one making the rules that he's not a perfect bull unless he throws a guy off and we're not going to see a guy ride a bull and be a hundred in the okay. current system under and the current and the current system. Then that's right. And that's the I'm best you're going to do is before, before Jose is done his career. I think he's gonna be hundred points and that's, I'm allowed to say that. So you're allowed to say that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Things are going to yeah. have to change. I think, but Hey, it's cool. It's fast. The world's um, changing faster than we know it. Things change. Other than that, I think, uh, I don't have any, I was just writing some goals while I was waiting for you here or I was getting to it. I didn't quite get started yet, but, uh, um, I don't have them, but you said you have one. That's, well, that's heading, a smart well, so we're heading, goal. We're heading into, uh, heading into, yeah, heading into 2022. So we'll kind of, we'll try a bit more about that, but yeah. So I want to run a half marathon in the first six months of 2022. So I have might be uh, a little cold still in, in the first half of 2022. I guess I'll run on a treadmill to train, right? It doesn't need to be running outside. But you said you're gonna run a half marathon within the first six months. So by by June, June yeah, by June, June I'll, by, by June I'll be able to run a, a half marathon. So are, they, like a, are there any in Canada? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm gonna find one. Then? There's one. There's one in Calgary. I think at either at end of May or June. So I just need some. Oh, like, okay. Schedule wise, I need to sign up for it and then start training. But did I you have, know that our editor Sean Morton is a uh, long distance? Yeah, summer? I did. That's pretty cool. I, and I yeah. think I, just something like I don't know. It's, did I you did you ask him for any tips yet? No. No, this is, I literally, I was just thinking about this on my drive, drive here. This what, what, what oh, I want you to want do. do it. And what why? I want to do in 2022. Why, uh, why just, do you want to do a it's, long it's, I think it's why more, do you want to torture yourself like that? I think it's more realistic in, in like fitness wise, rather than be like, Oh, I'm going to go to the gym every day or I'm going to do this and that. Right. Like there's, there's something to be achieved. And I'm like, when it comes to fitness and stuff, I need to have something motivate me to the end. Like when I was rodeo and like, it was to be a better bull rider, all that kind of stuff where it's like right now, I kind of, there's like nothing really to be like, okay, I can go to the gym and, and like, obviously overall health and fitness is, a, is an important thing, but I just, I still need to have that motivation of working towards something to, to make, get me motivated to do something. So I think if I have, okay, man, like you're entered up in this half marathon in May, you got to get your ass moving and start running and get trained up. So, I mean, that's where that motivation comes from. So that's, and I think it'd be fine. And then who knows what happens after that? Maybe a person does a full marathon or whatever it may be. Right. So I just think that's good. So, I mean, yeah, I got a. I have the Nike Run Club app downloaded, and you can build like a training crap platform, a training thing for it for when your date of your marathon, half marathon is. So I'm gonna follow that and be mindful of my diet and all that kind of stuff too. Mm-hmm. So and that's so kinda... by be mindful of your diet, that's not a specific goal. So I'm gonna run, So I talk to my. Goal. So my. So I talk to my brother and to help him like trim down stuff. He runs a calorie deficit. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to calculate what I need to do to operate at a calorie deficit to be able to train properly and still fuel my body. So that's, 
the diet I'm going to go, I'm going to approach with. And also, and, and, and then also just like kind of a personal goal too, is, is eat up, is be more diligent in, in making food at home and being, and that kind of stuff. So that, that'll help out as well. How is that measurable? Ordering less, skip the dishes. How is that timely? Time in what sense do you mean timely? Well, you just said you're going to order less, skip the dishes. Are you going to cook? So, like, so maybe so cook for yourself two times a week. Is I'm going to cook for myself. I'm going to cook for myself mm, probably four days of the week. What about when we're at the Calgary Stampede? When are you going to cook then? Well, I I live just down the street, so I should be able to cook at home. What about when we're in uh, in uh, Regina for a week? Well, then that's going to be that's going to be selecting stuff that is healthier to eat than six chicken nuggets at 10 p.m. So, so, but, but my point being is that those goals um, kind of have to change a little bit because you're not to make up. No, like exactly. Times exactly. And it'll be, be like it'll, four it'll, times a week when you're home, when I'm home. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, like, yeah. like I'm just trying to, I'm trying to help you. Yeah. 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 Specific yeah. So you can be and achieve your goals. What you see. I'm trying to Thanks, coach man. you. I here. appreciate it. I appreciate trying it. To coach you here a little bit. I appreciate it. But yeah. Yeah. So that's, that'll be obviously barring when we're on the road, when we're not on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we can make also, better choices when we are on the road, but that, yeah, I think by so doing too. that. And especially on this last trip, we have to live differently while we're there because we can't just mm-hmm. party every night. We got to go home and that, like, I guess that's what I, what I did on this last trip. I didn't feel as bad when I got home. Cause I kind of took care of myself a little bit more. Didn't stay out all night. You know, yeah. like I, we, I had plenty to drink and like we had fun lots of places, but I, Kind of oh, I, felt, I felt my... I felt substantially better getting home from our two weeks in Texas than I did coming home from Regina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm just saying that that way, I feel better. Uh, no, I, and that's that's part different of different choices. Of and sleep a little yeah. more and take your better well, care. So. Yeah, I think just take it's just overall the, the I think the theme of it is just taking better care, especially being on the road. Just the, it's yeah. easy to kind of get off track. So if you can kind of get a routine built where you take snacks. better care, pack some snacks and just be mindful of what you're eating and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it'll just try, it'll just make everything else that much better. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then let's wrap so, it up, boys. That's one of the man. Okay. Go to work. Thanks for uh listening, everybody. Thanks, Wacy. Appreciate another good year. Uh mm-hmm, looking man. forward to you know, maybe getting full time here next year. We're gonna look at that. I'm manifesting. Glad to have you back. That's one of the things I'm manifesting for 2022. I like it. Glad to have you back on the on the on the dark side, and uh, <laughs> making fun of those horse girls. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. But we'll. Uh, okay, yeah, I gotta get rolling. I gotta have some lunch okay, before we go here. But thanks for listening, everybody. This is Cowboy Shit. I'm Ted. He's Wacy. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Storm to Foe for keeping kicking ass on all of our everything. She's keeping track of our fucking some ass. Um, Sean Morton, once again, we appreciate you and uh, the listeners. Finally, the people, the fans, we're yeah. home fans, people sponsors, who listen, people support us, sponsors. Thanks. We we like you, we love you guys. Oh, and, yeah, and it don't... looks like looks like December might be one of our best months ever on the pod, as far as downloads. And November was already our best month ever, so cool. I'd love to hit a new high at least one month in twenty twenty two, maybe three or four or five or twelve. Who knows? But hey, I'd love to see that happen. So, we're doing it. We're doing all right. It. Thanks for listening, folks. See you Adios. Step right up, folks. Touch the sky. I've seen life change with just one ride. See newfound love from their first kiss. Sing. Old flames die on their second spin. And everyone gets a view from the top for just a second. The whole world stops. Round and